Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Scott. I'm one of the gastroenterologists here at the University of Colorado at the Crohn's and Colitis Center. I'm very excited to welcome everyone for the 10th annual University of Colorado Department of Medicine Research Day. We have a very exciting day planned for you with uh, several guest speakers. Uh, but initially, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Vineet Chopra. Uh, he began his medical career by attending medical school at the University of Mumbai before completing his residency at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in the Bronx VA. In 2008, he joined the faculty at the University of Michigan in the Division of Hospital Medicine, where he quickly rose through the ranks, uh, attaining uh, leadership positions as the co-director of health services research and the division chief of hospital medicine in 2017, and joined us here at the University of Colorado in October as our new chair of medicine. Uh, Dr. Chopra will be delivering some opening remarks for us. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Department of Medicine, I would like to welcome all of you to our annual research day in 2022. Um, today is uh, a special day for many of us, and for me, it's actually particularly momentous. Uh, first, uh, today is the first time in a long time that we're gathered together in person. And I don't know if I saw some of you earlier, but I was kind of excited walking around shaking hands today. Uh, given all that we've gone through over the past couple of years, I think it's fitting for a moment just to pause and look around the room and remember just how fortunate we are today to be able to do this. And I say this because our coming together today uh, is testimony to the importance of science and research and the endless spirit of human innovation that has brought us through this once in a lifetime event. And while we have all sacrificed personally and professionally, and many of us in this room have had our own personal battles with COVID-19, I think it's important for us to remember that we wouldn't have got here without research. Um, and we're coming together for research day uh, on this important occasion. And I couldn't be happier to see many of you in the room today and many of you on Zoom as well that I know are on online. Uh, second, I'm excited to tell you a little bit about our slate of activities today. Uh, to begin, you're gonna hear from some of our best and brightest talent, our outstanding early career scholars. The Outstanding Early Career Scholars Program is a hallmark of the spirit of mentorship and innovation that flows within our Department of Medicine. Uh, today, you'll hear about exciting advances in postpartum breast cancer treatment and how we integrate the care of the elderly with infectious diseases. You'll even hear a bit from this old guy about Michigan and some of the work I've done there to improve the care of patients that receive intravenous devices and how I think it's gonna to translate to our work here in Colorado. We're also gonna shine a spotlight on some of our brightest talent through the Abstract and Mentoring Award today. The annual mentoring award is especially poignant and important for me. It is among the most prestigious of recognitions we deliver as a Department of Medicine. Mentorship is the lifeblood of everything we do here. It is the foundation for success. And winners of this award are selfless leaders. Uh, they do this not because they get paid to do it or because they get a lot of prestige to do it. They do it because they believe in the importance of mentorship. And therefore, it's really fitting that our awardee for this honor is selected by the early career scholars who have benefited from that mentorship and support and have grown as a result of their trajectory from uh, this individual. And I look forward to celebrating our award winner this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have lunch, believe it or not. We're actually going to eat today together in person. Uh, and following lunch, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Cliff Rosen. He and I have already connected this morning, and we're talking about a paper already. So just FYI, this is how research happens. Um, uh, Dr. Rosen is going to tie it all together for us, a career in research from relatively humble beginnings to broad impact now as, as an editor in one of the most prestigious journals in the world, uh, reflecting on his journey and the lessons learned that I'm sure we will all benefit from. And finally, I hope many of you will join us for our virtual poster and Zoom sessions, moderated by many of our OECSP and junior scholars. There are QR codes in your program, so please have those handy. I'm going to be dropping in on many of them, and I hope to see many of you there as well. Um, today is possible because of a lot of work that happened behind the scenes, and I want to pa pause and close by thanking and recognizing the many people that have worked uh, countless hours to make this happen. So members of our Research Day Planning Committee, uh, Sri Raghavan, uh, Dr. Frank Scott, Dr. Christine Swanson, Dr. Jennifer Kemp, uh, Ms. Natalie Deliri, Ms. Heather Hallman, Holly Kaiser, and Amy Vucci in the back. Thank you for all the hard work and effort behind the scenes. 
I, I also want to thank our abstract review committee who, again, behind the scenes have been busy looking at all of the abstracts. Um, Dr. Bill Cornwell, Dr. Kristen Demerol, Dr. Joe Frank, Dr. Katharina Hopp, Dr. Tracy Lyons, Dr. Eric Pietras, Dr. Sri Raghavan, uh, Dr. Frank Scott, Dr. Kunwe Song, uh, and Dr. Christine Swanson and Dr. Beth Tamburini. So thank you all for your selfless work behind the scenes for our abstracts as well. What you're going to see today uh, is truly a labor of love by many individuals. So please join me in welcoming our next speaker. And I'm looking forward to an exciting day today. Thank you very much. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Tracy Lyons. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Division of Med Medical Oncology and a Department of Medicine Outstanding Early Career Scholars Program awardee. Dr. Lyons joined the faculty in the Division of Medical Oncology as an assistant professor in 2014, and she's now the senior scientist in the Young Women's Breast Cancer Translational Program. A major focus of her research is on aggressive breast cancers in young women, particularly in recently pregnant women or postpartum breast cancers. Her work has spanned a seminal paper on the first mouse model of postpartum breast, breast cancer to detailed studies of the role of a semaphorin protein family member in human breast cancer. With that breadth of scope, Dr. Lyons' work is truly translational from bench working in model systems to bedside with exciting work on potential novel diagnostics and treatments. Dr. Lyons, thank you for sharing your work with us today. Hmm. Can you hear me? Okay. Now I just have to figure out how to get it off of presenter mode for you guys. <laughs> um, should be more. Right. Yeah. Okay. Is this gonna no? I think here. That did. There we go. Okay. I think this will work. All right. Thank you so much for um, asking me to speak about our work today. And I just wanna say the Outstanding Early Career Scholars Program has definitely been a highlight of the past four years for me. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about some novel treatments for postpartum breast cancers. Um, I do have some disclosures to discuss that I am the partial owner of a novel therapeutic company called Perla Therapeutics that was recently um, founded. And I'm gonna talk about some off-label use of of some, some drugs. Okay, so in the Lions Lab, we focus um, on breast cancer, as was previously mentioned, and we are particularly interested in this molecule called semaphorin 7A, which seems to be expressed in particularly nasty breast cancers. This is a, one of our postpartum breast cancer patients um, who was 36 years old, one month after the birth of her second child, luminal B, type of breast cancer and lymph node positive. And so our patients are young, they have young children and they have particularly nasty breast cancers. So shown here is a lymphatic vessel full of tumor cells that express semaphore and 7A. I know some of my lab members hate these pictures. I'm sorry, I did not have time to update them. Um, this is my group, a bunch of talented young people um, doing great research who I'm proud to mentor. And as I mentioned, we focus on this molecule called semaphorin 7A. So my background is actually in normal mammary development. And I've always been fascinated about how the mammary gland develops both at puberty, during pregnancy, and ultimately to, do, um, to nurse our young during lactation. But what I'm really interested in is this process by which the, the mammary gland remodels back to the pre-pregnant state 
called postpartum mammary involution. We then take what we learn from this normal development and apply it to the way that breast cancers go from being normal tissue to being in C2 lesions to being invasive and metastatic disease. My longtime collaborator and director of the Young Women's Breast Cancer Program, Dr. Virginia Borges, together we have created a Young Women's Tissue Bank where we can then validate our findings in tissues from our patients with our ultimate goal of generating novel targeted therapies for breast cancer. So breast cancer and pregnancy is sort of a complicated relationship. And for many, many years, the protective effect of, of pregnancy on lifetime breast cancer risk has been recognized. So shown here is a relative risk for a woman to develop breast cancer with a nulliparous woman set to one. And, and as a function of age at first childbirth, you look at relative risk for developing breast cancer. And what you can see is that most women who have children are underneath the one. So they are protected from developing breast cancer over their lifetime. However, if you happen to be like me and most of the women probably in this room who have had children, most of us wait until we're over 30. And this actually may increase your lifetime risk permanently for developing breast cancer. In addition, every woman who has a child experiences a transient increased risk for developing breast cancer. So shown here are years after birth, and again, incident rate ratios or risk with a nulliparous woman being set to one. Each of these different colors represents a pregnancy greater than 30, pregnancy one 25 to 29, and pregnancy one less than 25. So the protective effect of pregnancy is very evident in these relatively young women who have children. They first have this spike in their increased risk of developing breast cancer, but then they cross over after about 10 years. However, as women are older at the time of first childbirth, it takes longer to cross over. And most women actually will never really cross over to that period of protection if they give birth after age 30. And in 2006, which coincidentally was when I was finishing my PhD, this was the first time in US history that there were more women in the green category than in the blue category, suggesting that these uh, pregnancy associated breast cancers or what we now call postpartum breast cancers are going to continue to rise. And so we, for a number of reasons, we have defined these postpartum breast cancers as those diagnosed within 10 years of recent childbirth. And but up until about uh, three or four years ago, we defined them as less than five years uh, diagnosed after childbirth in comparison to nulliparous women. And we, and we called them postpartum breast cancers within five years based on survival statistics. So if a woman in our cohort was diagnosed within five years um, and after adjustment for biologic tumor subtype, stage and year of diagnosis, what we saw is they had about 50. 50% five-year survival rates if they were diagnosed within five years of having a child compared to a nulliparous woman. And these, these patients are 2.7 times more likely to develop metastases compared to nulliparous patients. And this comprises about 44% of all young women's breast cancer. And if you extend that definition to 10 years, it's about 54% of all young women's breast cancers. So this is not a rare population of breast cancer patients. And this is our newest um, epidemiology paper published showing if we extend this definition out to 10 years, in fact, our um, patients diagnosed between five and 10 years are doing just as poorly um, as the, those who are diagnosed within five years. So now we're going out to 10 years postpartum. And this is about 25,000 cases of invasive breast cancer per year in the US. And so our hypothesis was that long-term changes in the normal mammary tissue that are induced by pregnancy, lactation, and, and postpartum evolution would be driving tumor genesis in postpartum women. And so shown here are tissue slices from some patients in our, in our cohort. These patients actually did not have breast cancer, but were biopsied at various stages of in their mammary development. So shown here is a uh, breast tissue from a nulliparous woman, a woman who was pregnant, actively lactating. This is undergoing the process of involution to return the breast to what it looked like before the pregnancy occurred. 
And as I've mentioned several times, this is the developmental window that we're really interested in. And we're interested in it because all sorts of things happen during involution that are reminiscent of what goes on in a tumor. So here's a, a representative image of a nulliparous breast tissue and how much more complicated it gets um, during involution. And so what you can see is that you get massive degradation of the extracellular matrix. You get influx of, of macrophages that help clean up the mess that's being made by, inv by involution. 80% of the cells that arose to make milk during lactation are going to die. And this results in um, lots of immune cell infiltrates and lots of, of cytokines that promote inflammation. And all of this could be predicted to promote um, tumor genesis. So we decided to test this many, many years ago by placing tumor cells into mouse mammary, intact mouse mammary glands from a mouse that was either nulliparous or undergoing involution. So the day after pups were weaned. What we saw was that the tumors implanted during involution grew faster. They were massively invasive. So this is a whole mount of a tumor from a nulliparous mouse and a an, an, an mouse undergoing involution. And you can see that it's too big to fit here and it's exploded all over the mammary gland. What we also saw is that this very lowly metastatic cell line, this is the mcf10dcis.com if you're interested, uh, doesn't normally result in lung metastases, but when you implant it to this environment, it actually actively forms lung metastases in mice. So why? So what we did was we took an, ex we did the same experiment and then we pulled the tumor cells back out based on their green. We saw that they were, permanently more motile and invasive. So you could go like 20 passages out after being in the mouse and they still were more motile and invasive. So we put them back into the nulliparous mouse and sure enough, they behaved permanently more invasive. So we did a microarray. And interestingly, what we were looking for were um, genes that went up in involution that were not up in the parental or in the nulliparous animal. And we actually only found three, which was kind of surprising. So I looked at this list. I did a literature search. I picked SEMA7A. Why? <laughs> because it was known for its role in axon guidance. And at the time, I was really interested in lymphatic development. And I thought, well, if it can help nerves develop, surely it can help lymphatics develop. And it does. So um, also... Very little was known about semaphore and seven at the time. So the, it's a member of this large family of molecules that are generally anchored to the membrane, but can also be secreted. It's the only one with the GPI membrane link, and it's the only one that ligands uh, beta-1 integrin, which I was very interested in given the, my background in extracellular matrix. So as I said, not a lot was known about it. Roles in axon, in axon outgrowth, spreading of melanocytes, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, monocyte migration, uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition in a mouse mammary tumor model. And it was known to promote macrophage um, dependent tumor associated angiogenesis. And so for those of you who don't know, a semaphore is a, a means to convey a signal across a long distance, often used by the Navy. And so here's the semaphore for hello. And so since studying um, semaphore and seven, since 2014, we have published um, results showing a role for semaphore and seven in almost all of the hallmarks of cancer um, shown here with our publications highlighted um, in bold. And so this nice little molecule that I showed you on the first slide turns out to not be such a nice little molecule. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we were very interested in lymph node, uh, lymph angiogenesis and lymph node metastases. And so I showed you this on the first slide, but these are semaphore and seven positive tumor cells in a lymphatic vessel that is also surrounded by macrophages. And we think that the macrophages actually help the tumor cells access the lymphatic vasculature. And in fact, our patients are more LVI positive in general, lymphovascular invasion, and actually tend to have more lymph node metastases. So this is how we think semaphorin is promoting um, metastatic spread. 
So over the course of the past 10 years or so, we've been staining breast tissues for semaphorin 7 from our patients in our University of Colorado cohort. And we see that um, normal breast tissue, normal adjacent breast tissue from postpartum women has on average more semaphorin, but the highest levels are observed in our postpartum breast cancer patients in their tumors themselves. But I will point out that the Nola Paris women also have expression of this molecule. So it's not just postpartum breast cancer. And based on these studies, we were able to identify a level of semaphorin 7 that was present in postpartum patients, approximately 36% shown here in the blue line. Um, these are, this is absent and present for recurrence in postpartum and nulliparous patients. And Kaplan-Meier relapse-free survival analysis revealed that this level of semaphorin 7 can significantly predict for poor survival rates in our patients. So we've modeled this um, in our mouse model. And this time we have control and knockdown cells injected into uh, mice undergoing involution. And what we see is um, that the knockdown actually decreases the amount of invasion. So the lighter gray here is what remains DCIS and the, and the darker colors are as DCIS progresses to invasive disease. And we were, were really able to keep uh, lesions non-invasive or less invasive when we knock it down. Similarly, when we overexpress it in nulliparous mice, which this cell line does not become invasive in, we see that it promotes the invasiveness of the lesion. And so this was published um, a couple of years ago showing that basically if we knock down semaphorin, this model of postpartum breast cancer is no longer aggressive. Furthermore, um, another analysis from our cohort had revealed to us that postpartum breast cancer patients who are positive for the estrogen receptor tend to do just as poorly as postpartum, uh, as nulliparous patients who are negative for the estrogen receptor. And to us, this really suggested that they're not responding to their anti-estrogen receptor therapy. And we were able to see this in the TCGA where we looked at patients who were being treated with uh, anti-ER therapy, they generally get it for five to 10 years. And when we looked at semaphorin 7 high patients, they were relapsing while on their endocrine therapy, suggesting that this therapy is not working for these patients. And this really was, um, this work was pretty much 100% supported by the Outstanding Early Career Scholars Program. And this was the work of a very talented graduate student, Lindsay Crump, who noticed that the blue, which is the luminal ER positive patients had on average more semaphorin seven. These are cell lines actually generated from patients. Then when we looked at tumors, when we compared triple negative to ER positive and basals to luminals, the luminals had more, ER positive has more, ER positive tumors with um, semaphorin seven, the patient's overall survival rates were lower, their distant metastases free survival rates were lower, and they were doing more poorly regardless of whether they were lymph node positive or not, suggesting that semaphorin 7 is really a driver of the aggressiveness of these tumors. So because we thought that these tumors would be resistant, we modeled this in an animal and we implanted control or overexpressor MCF7 human breast cancer cells into mice. We allowed them to grow to a certain size and then we started treating them with fulvestrin. And what you can see in fulvestrin is an ER degrader. What you can see is that the semaphorin 7 tumors did not respond, whereas the non-semaphorin 7 tumors did. And in fact, their tumor growth rates were higher and they developed metastases despite being on what would be standard of care for a patient. So uh, again, coming out of the Outstanding Early Career Scholars, one of my first meetings, Dan Pollier presented um, about his work with venetoclax. And so I immediately marched over to the Jordan lab and said, can we try some of this drug in our model? Because we had some evidence that BCL2 is really important um, in the mammary gland. So again, same experiment. We let the mice get tumors. We started fulvestrant. The semaphorin 7 shown here in red did not respond. We initiated venetoclax and um, the tumors responded quite well. And in fact, you can see a negative growth rate only in the overexpressors, suggesting that this should be a therapeutic option for postpartum patients. 
Another um, therapeutic option we have explored is anti pdl one treatment. So same experiment. This is actually an ER negative tumor now. And the what we we grew the tumors, we gave them anti pdl one or vehicle. And you can see that the semaphore and seven overexpressing tumors responded quite well to the anti pdl one uh, treatment, whereas the non overexpressors did not. And we've started to explore what's going on in these tumors. And what we see is that we are pretty good at getting rid of PDL1 positive tumor cells in this particular model when we treat with anti PDL1. But what we noticed, um, and this is the work of Alan Elder, another very talented grad student, is that we are enriching for semaphore and seven positive tumor cells when we give this. Uh, anti pdl one treatment, which is probably why they're not going away completely. Um, and we get, in fact, more of the tumor cells expressing it and, and their expression levels are also higher. So um, we now have shown that semaphore and 7A positive breast cancers are responsive to a number of different therapies, including those that target the immune system and those that target cellular survival. But again, we don't get complete regression. And so we now have um, funding from the Spark Reach program and the Gates Grubstake program to actually develop a novel diagnostic based on our IHC results, um, where we revealed this 36% threshold. But we also were able to test some of these same patients for semaphore and seven in their serum. And what we identified is that almost everyone who has greater than 30% semaphore and seven in their tumor has greater than one nanogram per mil in their serum. Um, I just wanna thank the people who have, have been involved in this work listed here, multiple sources of funding, wonderful um, collaborators both here and um, beyond the university. And again, I just wanna reiter reiterate how great this program has been for my lab and my career. So thank you all for your attention. Don't know how I did on time. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I think we have a microphone to pass around with for folks with questions. Just raise your hands and uh, looks like Beth Tamburini has a question. Um, so one of the observations, one of the, there it is on. Thanks for a great presentation, Dr. Lyons. So one of the observations in the leukemia world is that when you apply venetoclax based therapy, it's an incredibly powerful selective pressure to elicit um, subclonal populations that are resistant. So have you been able to model that kind of phenomenon either with your antibody or with venetoclax to see um, what kinds of biology evolves from these tumors? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have, um, in one of the experiments that I showed with the semaphorin antibody, for example, four of the tumors escaped the therapy. And so we've generated resistant subclones of those from those tumor cells. Uh, we just haven't gotten to do a lot of experiments on them yet, but it definitely is something that we are seeing happen. And, um, and we also see stem cell-like phenotypes in our resistant uh, populations. They survive in Anchorage independence um, and they are resistant to chemotherapy and most of the things that you try to hit them with. So we're working on that. That's a great question. Great talk, Tracy. Um, so in your graph where you did the anti pdl one and you saw that it went down and you saw that the ones that escaped the anti pdl one treatment, they were all SEM7A sem positive, mm -hmm. right? So did you try using your SEM7A antibody and see if you can get it back down to zero? Yeah, we really want to do that. Haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Our most recent batch of SEM7A antibody precipitated out when we purified it. So we're now having to do, I don't see Alan here, but he has to watch this column go drip, 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 <laughs> drip. Um, and so we're at, right now we're limited by the antibody, but we're just, we're gonna try to clone it and then um, express it in like Cho cells or something instead of having to rely on the hybridoma. On the, on the other side here. 
So as soon as we have antibody, we will be doing that experiment. <laughs> Since the semaphorins are widely expressed, yes, and I would guess that 7A is also, what about off-target effects of your antibody? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in fact, we just stained a human tissue microarray, um, and it is expressed in a lot of places. Um, I haven't decoded the microarray for myself yet, so I don't know what, where. Um, however, our mice don't have any liver or kidney function issues when they're on the treatment. Um, they don't seem crazy, <laughs> but we haven't tested that yet. However, I will also say there's a full semaphore and seven knockout mouse, and it's fine. It runs around the cage. It's fertile. It's, um, it has a, a defect in the olfactory tract. Everybody's heard me tell this joke at this point, but we just joke that it can't smell the cheese. Um, and so, so we're hopeful, but we haven't um, completely narrowed down all of the sub potential side effects that it might have. Yes. Yes, and that's actually how we came upon the e the ER uh, estrogen receptor because we we read that paper that was showing that it was dependent on estrogen and progesterone, and in fact, that's what how we landed in ERPR positive breast cancer. Is it known how breastfeeding influences the incidence of this the high semaphorin cancer? Great question. I could go on and on and on about that for days. Um, it basically would require us to do a prospective study where we would ask women to wean at six months before they start giving solid food to really test that. Um, and, and doing retrospective studies on things like lactation are really hard because everybody does it differently. Um, I will say that there are no studies out there showing that Lactation would increase your risk for postpartum breast cancer or increase your risk for semaphore and seven breast cancer. Um, so we don't think that, we do think that lactation is protective overall for um, nasty breast cancers. It's just really hard to do those studies. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Lyons. Wonderful presentation. I'd like to echo thank you for an excellent talk. Um, it's uh, my privilege to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Christine Erlinson. She's an associate professor of medicine here in the Division of Infectious Disease. Uh, her research interests are comprised of the interaction between age and HIV-related care, adherence to HIV-related care, and more recently, complications related to COVID-19. Her work has been funded through multiple mechanisms, including NIH Career Development Awards and most recently two R01s through the National Institute of Aging. And she served in multiple leadership roles, including uh, Associate Director of the HIV Postdoctoral T32, the CCTSI's Pre-K Award Program, and she's also been funded through the Outstanding Early Career Scholars Program here as well. Uh, today, she'll be talking to us about integrating geriatric medicine into, IBD, or, uh, in, into HIV related care. I'm very excited to hear her talk. Deal there. Doesn't matter if it's on that version. I put it on the um, kiosk one. I think that's probably fine. Okay, it just has a little bar at the top. I don't think it matters too much. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity per to present today, um, as well as to be in person. As Dr. Chopra mentioned, this is the first time many of us have been in person, and this is my first in-person talk for two years, other than a um, lecture I gave to two residents last week. So maybe a little bit rusty, but hopefully this goes okay. So um, as I end my time on the Outstanding Early Career Scholars Program, I wanted to highlight some of the tremendous impact that this program's had on my research and my career over the last five years. Um, it's really allowed me to go in a lot of new directions with my research, uh, form lots of new collaborations that wouldn't have been possible without this funding. 
As an infectious disease physician scientist, my research over the last 10 years, uh, research and clinical care over the last 10 years has really focused on HIV medicine. Um, and I wanted to spend just a little bit of time on some background with HIV for those of you who don't see HIV patients in the clinic or regularly take care of them on the inpatient services. Uh, you may not realize this, but we are now over 40 years into the HIV epidemic. HIV was first, or the, the term AIDS was first coined now in 1982. It was a year later when we recognized that HIV was the cause of AIDS. Um, and it took about four more years before we had any treatments, much longer course than what we see with some of our infectious diseases, such as COVID now. Uh, the first treatment, AZT, proved fairly toxic for the first several years. Patients developed resistance relatively quickly. We did have a few other treatments all in the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor class. Over the subsequent decade, uh, patients continued to develop rapid virologic failure on those single drug regimens until protease inhibitors were introduced in 1996 and really revolutionized the care of HIV. In 2010, we found that Truvada was effective in preventing acquisition of HIV, introducing PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. And then actually by 2018, the majority of people who are eligible for antiretroviral therapy worldwide are able to receive them uh, due to a combination of different programs. With a combination of highly effective antiretroviral therapy, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and a, an emphasis on early treatment and diagnosis, uh, we now see that a majority of people living with HIV in the U.S. are actually age 50 or older, seen in kind of the darker blue circles on the left side of that figure. We see similar proportions of aging older adults or of older adults in Africa, as well as other um, less developed regions of the world. If we focus just on the last 20 years, since we've had more highly effective antiretroviral therapy, we've seen continued improvements in life expectancy, as you can see by those kind of blue triangles in the middle. Um, but we still have a gap of life expectancy compared to people without HIV of about 10 years. Even more striking is over the same period of time, there's really been no narrowing in the differences in years living without a comorbidity. If you look at the bottom half of the figure, at age 21, people with HIV have an average about average of about 10 years before they develop a comorbidity, and that's a comparison to those without HIV who probably don't develop a comorbidity for another 25 to 30 years. Indeed, we see that people with HIV have an increased burden of multiple different comorbidities across the age spectrum. This figure shows people with HIV on the left and people without HIV on the right. And I've just highlighted the 50 to 59 year old age category in the red box. If you look at the dark gray box at the bottom of each of these columns, you can see that those with HIV, um, about 20% of people have no comorbidities in that 50 to 59 year old age group. Whereas in the other side of the figure, about 60% of people without HIV have no comorbidities at age 50 to 59. We see an increased risk of numerous different comorbidities. People with HIV have about double the risk of cardiovascular disease, up to 30 times the risk of some cancers, such as anorectal, disease, or anorectal cancer, and up to four times the risk of a fracture. There's many different factors that contribute to this increased risk of comorbid diseases in people with HIV. We see a loss of regulatory T cells as part of the virus effects. We see ongoing viral replication, even in people who are on suppressive antiretroviral and have retroviral therapy and have a undetectable viral load when we check it in clinic. Um, there's probably residual effects of older antiretroviral therapies, such as AZT and DDI, that may have caused mitochondrial damage. Um, we also see ongoing effects of lipodystrophy, that loss of facial fat or lipoatrophy, um, some of the lipo uh, hypertrophy or kind of buffalo hump that we see in patients probably has an ongoing inflammatory effect. There's probably an increased risk of some traditional risk factors for comorbidities in people with HIV, such as an increased risk for substance use and decreased physical activity. People with HIV are often co-infected with different pathogens such as CMV, um, HPV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. And then shifts in the microbiome and gut barrier are also altered in HIV. Together, all of these factors contribute to an increased levels, increased levels of inflammation and immune activation, which we think underlie the development of many different comorbidities um, and increase that risk of comorbid conditions in people with HIV. 
So this burden of comorbid conditions, increased inflammation, and immune activation has a profound impact on the aging process, particularly in people with HIV. It impacts the way that someone can function in their daily life. And our research, instead of focusing on individual comorbidities, comorbidities has really been focused on the, this physical function or frailty that people uh, experience, kind of a composite measure of all of these different impacts over time. Physical function may better reflect how someone feels and functions in their daily life than a measure of chronologic age. And a good example of this, as you can see in many of these different people over the age spectrum, is walking speed or gait speed. Walking speed incorporates the impact of numerous comorbidities, is an important component to living independently, and has been strongly associated with mortality. This figure shows data from people living without HIV, but you can see the profound influence that gait speed has on predicting mortality. If you focus on that top arrow, this shows somebody at about age 70. If that person has a gait speed of about 1.5 meters per second or a fairly brisk walking speed, they probably have up to 30 years of remaining life left. In contrast, that same 70-year-old who has a walking speed of about 0.2 meters per second or 0.3 meters per second, a very slow gait speed, may only have 10 years of remaining life left. From data in both populations with and without HIV, we know that physical function impairments are a major predictor of loss of independent living. We've shown that frailty and physical function impairments are also associated with falls and fractures and an increased risk of some comorbidities in people with HIV, uh, particularly uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And we certainly do see that when we look at populations of people with HIV, even we, when we compare them to uh, people without HIV who has very similar risk factors and uh, can, can control for um, substance use and other risk factors that may differ between populations, we see a faster decline in gait speed as well as an increased prevalence of frailty. In the figure on the left, those with HIV are shown in the red line and those without HIV in the blue line. And we see a faster decline in gait speed in those with HIV that really seems to accelerate starting at about age 50. In the figure on the left, those with HIV are in the black diamonds and the HIV uninfected in the um, empty black squares. And you can see the proportion of people that experience frailty at any of the study visits in this large cohort, uh, again, seem to drastically increase starting at about age 50. So this concept of frailty is what, we, what really got me interested in this area of HIV and aging as a fellow. And it helped to describe my patients that I was seeing in the clinic and on the inpatient services that seemed like they were about 10 to 15 years older than they really were. This figure highlights some of the underlying mechanisms that we think contribute to frailty in the general population, and many of these pathways are further impacted by HIV viremia itself or by some of the long-term effects that we see from antiretroviral therapy. A lot of my research over the past 10 years has focused on describing how these pathways may occur in people with HIV and developing physical function impairments, um, as well as how this might compare to frailty that we might see in people without HIV. We've used uh, cohorts um, both at the University of Colorado from our clinics, as well as many national and international cohorts to compare these effects. Um, this work has really been instrumental in helping inform what I might do for interventional work. So with a good understanding of the factors that contribute to frailty, my goal during my K23 was to intervene to try to slow or reverse the trajectory of frailty. Based on our work, we knew that physical activity was one of the strongest predictors of frailty or physical function. Um, we also knew from the geriatric literature that exercise was one of the most effective ways to decrease physical function or to improve physical function and decrease frailty over time. Um, however, there were a lot of unknowns regarding exercise recommendations in HIV. In fact, most of the exercise data in HIV was focused on patients in the AIDS wasting days and trying to improve their muscle mass or focused on trying to reverse some of the lipodystrophy that we saw with earlier treatments. What we didn't know was whether people that were older that had HIV would actually have the same responses to exercise as someone that was younger. We didn't know if we could give them the same kind of exercise recommendations or if to overcome this increased burden of comorbidities, we needed to tell them to exercise differently. We also didn't know if we had people exercise at a higher intensity, if it might actually exacerbate that chronic low-grade inflammation that I told you contributes to comorbidities or potentially lead to more injuries and maybe not be beneficial in this population. 
So to answer these questions, we enrolled a study of people with and without HIV who were aged 50 or older and were not previously exercising. All of our participants started at a moderate intensive exercise, which we defined, or a cardiovascular and resistance exercise, which we defined based on their predicted heart rate maximum on a VO2 max test, as well as their ability to lift um, a certain amount of weight in a one repetition maximum. We started everyone at a moderate intensity exercise for the first 12 weeks of our study to avoid kind of precipitating injuries and get people used to exercise. And then after the first 12 weeks, we randomized people to continue with that same exercise intensity or advance to a higher intensity exercise just based on a higher percent of their one repetition max and their heart rate max. The main results of our study are summarized in this figure. Those with HIV are shown in the red bars. Those without HIV are shown in the black bars. The kind of darker part of the bar shows the improvement in the first 12 weeks of the study. And then that grayer portion shows the improvement in the second 12 weeks of the study. The percent improvement is on the bottom axis. And then you can see different physical function markers that we assessed along the X axis. Overall, we found that our participants improved anywhere between about 10 to 45% on most of these physical function markers, which is a pretty impressive gain in function over 24 weeks of the study. Um, we actually saw pretty similar improvements in most of these tests between people with and without HIV, with a few exceptions that I marked with an asterisk. Uh, you can see that people with HIV actually had significantly greater improvements in time to walk 400 meters, in the time to climb a flight of stairs or their stair climb time, and in their VO2 maximum. I don't show the data here, but we also found that people with HIV tended to have greater improvements with higher intensity exercise, particularly in some of the strength measures like bench press, leg press, and lateral pull down. And they did not have an increase in their adverse events, which is one of the things we were concerned about. Unfortunately, we called all of our participants about three months after completing the in-person portion of the exercise and found that less than 50% of them were actually exercising at all, um, and most of them maybe one day a week or, or more. So we knew that our next study had to really focus on adherence and getting people to continue some of these lifestyle behaviors. So with some support of the some supplemental NIH funding, as well as really the OECSP, I was able to collect a lot of secondary outcomes that really would not have been possible with the small budget of a K award. Um, we looked at body composition through DEXA and found that people with HIV tended to have significantly greater decreases in fat compared to those without HIV, which was particularly important in those that had this ongoing lipodystrophy effects of their older antiretroviral therapy. We also looked at several inflammatory markers as we wanted to make sure we weren't exacerbating underlying inflammation. We did find that those with HIV tended to have a blunted increase in their anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10, but they did have a significant, significantly greater decrease in um, high sensitivity CRP in the higher intensity group, suggesting that there may be some benefit of that higher intensity exercise. Unfortunately, we didn't see much of an effect on outcomes of sleep and quality of life in those with HIV. We did see some moderate improvements in those without HIV, suggesting uh, that exercise probably is not going to resolve some of the sleep issues in HIV. Interestingly, we gave all of our participants pedometers to wear throughout the study, and we found that those with HIV had lower step counts at baseline um, and then tended to exercise less on the days that they weren't coming into the exercise center than those without HIV, again, kind of telling us we need to do something to change overall behaviors, not just through the intervention. We looked at some changes in the plasma lipidome and actually saw exactly opposite changes in those with and without HIV. We're not entirely sure what to make of that, but it was uh, interesting. We looked at some skeletal muscle biopsy samples and looked at methylation patterns in skeletal muscle. On this, we found that um, many different differentially, different, differentially um, uh, regulated uh, I'm forgetting my, the word here, DMPs, um, differentially methylated uh, patterns in those with HIV and those without HIV at baseline. Um, after our exercise intervention, the muscles actually looked more similar, suggesting that some of these changes were being altered by exercise. And then importantly, we also collected really valuable data on interviews with our participants that got a little bit more at some of the barriers and facilitators to starting exercise and continuing exercise. 
With support of both the OECSP funds as well as the Gallup program, we explored some differences in the microbiome and short-chain fatty acids by age, HIV sero status, and before and after exercise. Um, in some exploratory work that's shown in the figure here, we also looked at some associations between the microbiome and physical function. Uh, so this figure shows that with higher levels of Escherichia, we saw poorer performance on the short physical performance battery, a uh, measure that looks at gate speed, um, balance, and time to rise from a chair. And then we also saw that higher levels of butyrate were associated with greater grip strength. So this raised some questions as to how physical function in the microbiome might be associated. Uh, and we submitted some more investigations with this as an R01 that, are re that gets reviewed tomorrow. Um, we were particularly intrigued by some findings that we saw in the skeletal muscle. And this we were able to run uh, in Dr. Rusch's lab with support of the OECSP funds. We used stored skeletal muscle samples and looked at mitochondrial content, both at baseline and after exercise. This shows the change in mitochondrial content after our exercise intervention. People with HIV in the red circles and those without HIV in the blue, the blue squares. Um, notably, we saw some blunted increases and even decreases in some key components of mitochondria, such as citrate synthase or CS, manganese sulfide dismutase, uh, manganese dismutase sulfa, I can't remember that one, um, and then PGC1 uh, alpha, which are um, some of the, the ones with the asterisks shown. Um, importantly, um, uh, we didn't, if you recall, our people with HIV actually had significantly greater improvement in physical function. So we saw these blunted increases in mitochondrial content while we saw greater increases in function. So some disconnect um, kind of raised questions of do we need a different type of exercise that might help overcome these mitochondrial impairments? And might this help with fatigue and potentially even with some of our longer term adherence? So combining our qualitative data on barriers and facilitators to exercise, our mitochondrial findings, our findings that a higher intensity of exercise might lead to greater improvements in strength and inflammation, we proposed the health study. Um, this study was funded one month into co the COVID pandemic, so it took a little bit longer than anticipated to get up and running since the research centers were closed for several months. Um, but this, this study is enrolling 100 people with HIV. We did not include an uninfected control group for this study at two different sites, both here and at the University of Washington. Our participants are coming in and being randomized to either the same continuous moderate exercise that we did during our prior study, they essentially work up to a goal of walking on the treadmill for 50 minutes, or a high intensity interval training. Um, some data has shown that high intensity interval training may improve longer term adherence, people get less bored with the exercise as it offers something different each day, um, and then it may actually have better cardiovascular improvements. Our primary outcome is looking at physical function and fatigue, but then we're also looking at more, going into much more depth on the mitochondrial measures that we saw in our prior study. We're doing Ouroboros in real time and looking both at skeletal muscle and um, peripheral blood mononucleosites to get a better idea if, if mitochondrial function is changing in addition to the content. And then to address the issue of adherence in our prior study, we um, have introduced some more factors to kind of transition people from their center-based exercise to home exercise. All of our participants meet with a trainer. They get an exercise prescription that they develop with the trainer with some goals that they want to try to target over the subsequent three months. Um, they get a Fitbit to help monitor their exercise and their, their daily activity to try to help them reach those goals. And then we have a second randomization at this stage where they get randomized to either this motivational health kind of um, meeting with their trainer to go over specific barriers and how they can address those barriers versus just a standard text message that says like, have a great day, you're doing great. Um, all of our participants come in once a month and get physical function assessments just to kind of keep touch, uh, keep base with them or keep, keep in touch with them and make sure they're continuing to exercise. So we're hoping this can actually help people transition from the research center to their home-based exercise. We have a couple of um, ancillary R01 opportunities on this that are pending where we can look at MR spectroscopy of the muscle, as well as some changes in cognitive function with exercise. So in addition to studying interventions to, frail, to reverse frailty, I also wanted to incorporate frailty and physical function into some of our clinical uh, trials that occur in HIV. 
both as a way to study how other interventions might impact function as a secondary outcome and to understand some of the variability that we see in responses to interventions. For example, in the setting of a statin, does someone who's older and frail have the same response to that statin as someone who's much younger who may have a better cardiovascular response? So in the second year of my K award, a perfect opportunity came along and that a large randomized clinical trial of statins among 8,000 people with HIV to decrease cardiovascular disease had just been funded and they had a call for secondary proposals. So I submitted a proposal and then eventually an R01 to fund the addition of physical function markers in this large clinical trial, um, as well as using looking at muscle quality that we were able to measure on the fat density of thoracic muscles um, as a second read of the cardiac CAT scans that are, were obtained as part of this study. So we proposed to measure these physical function and muscle quality measures in about 800 people from the larger trial. We wanted to see if statins change physical function or decrease muscle quality or change muscle quality, as well as to answer that question of whether people with greater functional impairment respond differently to statins. Uh, we've also been able to incorporate physical function markers into a couple of AIDS clinical trials group studies that I'm involved with, one looking at semaglutide for fatty liver. And we're able to look, we are including uh, both time to rise from a chair and gait speed to see if decreasing fat in the liver and potentially fat in the muscle may lead to some improvements in muscle function. And then more recently, we have looked at some uh, or worked with some of our HIV cure colleagues in the AIDS clinical trials group to try to introduce some physical function measures in some of their attempts um, using synolytics and immune modulatory therapy for HIV cure to see if as we get rid of synolytic cells, can we also improve uh, function in older adults. Um, so I was quite entrenched in the HIV and aging world when along came COVID and disrupted life as we all know it, especially for those of us in infectious disease. Um, early on, we recognized that people that were hospitalized with COVID were likely to have a fairly profound impact on their physical function, due in part to high levels of inflammation that many patients with COVID were experiencing, prolonged bed rest with time on the ventilator, um, high dose of corticosteroids that many patients were experiencing. Um, and uh, probably some due to some limited rehab opportunities that patients had. A lot of our patients were getting discharged from the hospital and either didn't have insurance to follow up with rehab, or um, a lot of the rehab facilities actually shut down and weren't accepting patients because of concerns for um, being if the patient's still being contagious. So to address this need, Jennifer Stevens Lapsley and I, from um, she's from physical therapy, we submitted a supplement to my R01 that was on statins and HIV and somehow connected it to COVID um, to support the after study. So we focused on participants who were discharged from, the, from a COVID hospitalization, did not have access or ability to see physical therapy. Um, we had a treatment group that, in, that uh, used virtual physical therapy, motivational interviewing to help patients overcome barriers, Fitbits to help them receive, to achieve their physical activity goals. And then we had a educational program that they could access through an app that did some breathing exercises and different exercises they could focus on at home. And then compared this to a control group that received just the Fitbits and education. Um, we checked in frequently with both groups at least once a week to make sure they were doing okay and doing physical function assessments at home just so participants felt like they were being followed and watched, which I think alone had quite a bit of effect on people who were scared at the beginning of COVID. Um, overall, as you can see in the figure, um, our virtual physical therapy um, uh, intervention really didn't have a lot of benefit over our control uh, intervention. However, we did find that it was safe and feasible. We were able to reach a lot of rural populations who actually didn't have a lot of access to physical therapy. Um, and we also found that even some of our patients that had limited technology experiences managed to use their Zoom um, and could do these virtual assessments. Um, but I think this suggests that just focused education on increasing activity, kind of checking in on people and providing them some specific recommendations for activity may also be really beneficial in those that can't access therapy. With support of the OECSP funds, as well as a little bit from this R01 supplement, we were also able to delve a lot more into some electronic medical record data. We established a small cohort of people we followed with virtual assessments early on in the pandemic from our clinic. Um, and a lot of this work was actually led by students who were on their COVID elective at the time as they got kicked off their services on the inpatient side. 
Um, we looked at some disparities in physical therapy referral and found that our Hispanic patients that were hospitalized with COVID actually had fewer PT referrals after we adjusted for different risk factors. Um, we found a fairly high symptom burden in people discharged from the hospital with COVID and a fairly slow recovery, particularly early on. We looked at some different factors that impacted rehab therapy allocation, that things to think about when we're dealing with a pandemic such as this and how we can prioritize who gets rehab therapy. Um, and then with some colleagues in Toronto, we used some R01 funding that we had in HIV to look at how episodic disability that we had looked at in HIV also impacts patients with long COVID. Um, with some colleagues in HIV, as well as several students, we looked at how COVID differs in people with and without HIV. And then with some colleagues in critical care, infectious disease, and informatics, we also looked at some early predictors of poor outcomes. And all this was really funded by the OECSP. So this work in COVID led to my involvement and opportunity to serve as the site PI of the RECOVER study, which you will hear about a little bit more um, later this morning or the early this afternoon by Dr. Rosen as we were um, discussing over dinner last night. Um, the RECOVER study, for those of you who don't know, is a large NIH-funded cohort that's looking at, um, it's called Researching COVID to en Enhance Recovery, looking at the long-term impact of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there's four different cohorts in RECOVER. Um, we are part of the adult cohort, and our site at the University of Colorado is also part of the EHR cohort that's led by Melissa Handel and Tel Bennett here at the university. The adult cohort plans to enroll almost 18,000 participants nationwide, either at the time of infection, in um, any time point after infection, up to three years after initial infection, and then a control group without uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2, fellow participants for up to four years to look at resolution of COVID symptoms and different factors that might uh, influence COVID. We'll be enrolling both here at Anschutz and at Denver Health. And the study uses these tiered assessments where everyone in the study gets a tier one assessment, so kind of a baseline, um, some vital signs, fills out questionnaires and gets labs. Um, and then uh, different tiers testing, tier two and tier three are based on their presentation and types of symptoms and lab abnormalities. I had the opportunity to be involved in some of the initial protocol development and actually strongly ad advocated for including physical function in the study. And we were fortunate enough um, to include the 30 second sit to stand time in everyone as part of the tier one assessment, uh, in part because it takes about 30 seconds to perform and doesn't require anything other than a chair and a stopwatch. So, um, and then uh, we do have some additional measures that are included as part of tier two and th tier three testing. So. Um, the study has been a bit slow to get going, but I think it will hopefully provide a lot of information about long COVID. Um, and we just started recruiting about three weeks ago. So if you are interested or know anyone that's interested, feel free to email recover at cuanschutz.edu. Uh, to summarize, I just want to give a huge thank you to Dr. Schwartz and those who made the o OECSP funds possible over the last several years. This award has really allowed me to expand collaborations and research areas to support a lot of trainees and to provide instrumental preliminary data that has informed a lot of new grants and publications. I'd also like to give Dr. Chopra a warm welcome. He's already provided some valuable input to me and no doubt will continue to expand the support and mentorship of junior faculty, particularly at this vulnerable transition stage between K awards and R awards. I also want to thank my numerous mentors and collaborators here at the university. Um, there's a lot of students, residents, and fellows that I also didn't list, um, and then my collaborators that are elsewhere, as well as my funding. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much for that excellent talk. Uh, really great to see your progression of your research program over time. Um, I think we have time for one to two questions before moving on. Got one there in the back. Is there any change in the? Oh yeah, sorry. Is there any change in the overall viral burden with exercise? Because the number of cells which are infected with HIV, they are fairly constant. They don't change much, and with the use of hard therapy. Mm -hmm. So uh, even without, you know. So the question is, what is the effect on total viral burden with exercise? You know, I don't know that that has been looked a lot, a lot in the current antiretroviral therapy era. I know there was uh, early on, there was a lot of interest in using exercise to try to increase T cells and decrease viral load before we had effective treatment. 
Um, we actually only include people with a suppressed viral load on our studies and have focused much more on the functional outcomes. Um, we so I don't I don't have our measures of kind of viral reservoir, but I think it's really interesting, particularly as we can decrease inflammation. Could we potentially have an effect on the viral reservoir? Um, I don't know the answer, but I think it's a very interesting question. Thanks, Dr. Erlinson. Great presentation. Um, you know, your, your mitochondrial data was striking. The fact that you failed to increase mitochondrial markers is, is worrisome. Um, in the context of oxidative insults when we give chemotherapy, patients get exercise therapy after the therapy is over, so there's a recovery period. Mm -hmm. I wonder if part of the problem here is you're doing this presumably while these patients are still on antiviral, antiretroviral agents, and therefore you're essentially pushing oxidative stress in the context of an agent that's maintaining an inflammatory state. And, and possibly there's an intervention there that involves something more along the lines of increasing antioxidant um, load during, during exercise, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. I, the average time on antiretroviral therapy for our participants is about 20 years. So most of them have been on therapy for quite a long time. And a lot of them did receive um, older toxic therapy that we know has a lot of impact on the mitochondria. So I don't know how much of this is old damage um, that they've persisted with. And Jane and I have talked about this a lot, but our are we seeing a loss of mitochondria, but people are able to compensate in the function? And so that's why we thought it was so important to get Ouroboros in the next study to see maybe the mitochondria are working fine or even working in overdrive. There's just a loss of them from prior damage. So I think our findings from the current study will be really interesting. And I saw one more question. Kathy. Great talk. Um, I'm curious whether in your HIV studies, you've looked at the influence of exercise on intestinal barrier function? It's a great question. Um, we looked a little bit at um, just in peripheral, I think we looked at soluble 163. We didn't see any significant changes. Um, in our inflammatory work, we looked at soluble CD14 as kind of a rough marker. Um, we actually saw really high increases in soluble CD14. Um, we saw huge increases in those with HIV, regardless of what exercise intensity. Um, and both the groups kind of ended up at the same level. It was almost like there was a maximum that they were able to reach with the exercise. Um, but at the same time, their other inflammatory markers didn't change a lot. It didn't make a lot of sense. Um, and I think the LPS actually didn't change much. So we were uh, really struggled to find anything in the general literature about what soluble CD14 does with exercise and kind of ran into a lot of roadblocks. I think there were a couple of studies that looked at like in the setting of a marathon race, people had these rapid increases in soluble CD14, but not a lot with chronic exercise. So I wouldn't mind talking to you more about that later. See if you have other thoughts. Thanks. Thank you again. Let's see if we can't figure this out. Yeah. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Vinit Chopra. As we heard earlier, um, Dr. Chopra joined us at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in October of last year as our chair of the department. His innovative outcomes research has focused on improving the safety of hospitalized patients through prevention of hospital acquired complications. He's been funded by multiple federal organizations from the VA, AHRQ, and the NIH, and has resulted in over 250 publications, including in, in prestigious journals such as the BMJ, JAMA, and the Lancet and Annals of Internal Medicine. He also serves as the deputy editor at the Annals of Internal Medicine and is a member of the editorial board of the American Journal of Medicine. In addition to research, as we heard from him uh, uh, earlier, Dr. Chopra has focused much attention on the art and science of mentoring, including highly cited pieces in the Harvard Business Review, Annals of Internal Medicine, JAMA, and BMJ, among others on this topic. Over the course of his career, Dr. Chopra has received numerous awards, not only for research, but also for teaching and mentorship. And in recognition of those efforts as a mentor, uh, training the next generation of physician scientists, he was named a Distinguished Clinical and Translational Research Mentor at the University of Michigan in 2019. We're really excited to hear from Dr. Chopra about his work uh, on appropriate use of intravenous catheters with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. That's great. There's a, there's a theme here that I'm picking up on. We're going from mice to people to hospitals. 
Um, but it's a it's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Thanks for for joining. And I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about my history at Michigan, but I'm gonna end in Colorado about a path forward. So here's some disclosures. Uh, you already heard this work that I'm gonna share today has been funded by HRQ. Uh, the Michigan Hospital Medicine Safety Consortium, or HMS, is funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield, Blue Care Network of Michigan, and you'll see why in a few slides, why an insurance company would fund uh, a research project. Uh, I've been supported by grants from a number of different institutions there, and I also receive support from ACP for my role at Annals as well. So I'm going to start with a story, and the story uh, goes back to sort of uh, thinking about my research career. And I'm gonna frame this as a clinical problem. I'll talk to you about a, a, one of our most recent implementation studies that actually spans uh, thousands of patients to give you a sense of the impact of the work that's had. Uh, I'll share with you some results some strengths and limitations and then some conclusions about a path forward, specifically how I see this in Colorado. Uh, as many of you have heard today, the clinical problem begins with a patient. This is Georgian Ziegler. Uh, Georgian and I met in 2008 when I was a first year hospitalist at Michigan. Uh, I've known her for almost 15 years, and I have a text from her that I'm going to read to you at the end of this talk today. But uh, Georgianne, when I met her, was 56 years old, and she had chronic pancreatitis, and she was admitted to the hospital for one of her usual flares. Uh, at the time, she had a very complex hospital stay. She developed all kinds of complications, spent time in the ICU, and I was the hospitalist taking care of her when she came out of the ICU. And she needed long-term venous access for parenteral nutrition. She couldn't eat uh, anymore. And she needed calcium pretty much every three days to keep her electrolytes in order. And the hospitalist caring for her, that was me at the time, ordered a double lumen peripherally inserted central catheter or a PIC for IV access. I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. Uh, two weeks later, she came back and she said, my arm is swollen and hurting and I'm having trouble breathing. And I was on again, and I took care of her again. Here's an ultrasound of what happened next. So uh, these blue arrows here point to the catheter. That's the pick line in the axillary vein. Around it is this gray stuff. Uh, and that gray stuff is a blood clot. And so she had a very large thrombosis of the axillary and subclavian vein. And on her CT scan of her lung, uh, she also had this filling defect that we know is a pulmonary embolism. So she had a life-threatening complication from this device that I ordered for her as part of her clinical care. Um, still remember that feeling. It's a pretty bad feeling, uh, thinking about harm that may have been done. So my question today, and the thing that I've been trying to answer for the past 15 years is, was placing this device the right choice? Let me start with telling you what a PIC is, because I recognize there are people in the room that may not be clinicians. So a PIC is a four-letter word in my vocabulary. Um, it is, is an acronym for a peripherally inserted central catheter. And what it is, is a catheter that goes into your veins from the arm, snakes up the large veins of your chest and goes into your heart. And the idea there is you can actually get access to the central circulation and deliver all kinds of toxic treatments without having somebody have a procedure that goes into the neck or into the chest. So it's a safer way of inserting a catheter, and it's become very popular. This is data from iMarket Research that shows you the growth of the vascular access industry. The green bars here essentially are the market value for PICs. And if you look at all the other colors, the one that's growing the most is that green bar. And they, these devices are abundant everywhere. Uh, just a quick note, at the University of Colorado, we place close to 6,000 PICs a year uh, across our system. Uh, and that number is going up as well. So this is big business, and it's a very common device. Why are they so common? They're, they're safer to put in. So this is the anatomy of the upper extremity. We place picks in those veins in adults, the brachial and the basilic veins. And because we place them there, we avoid those big three complications, the trauma to the vessels of the neck and the chest, uh, a pneumothorax, which for those of you who don't know, is when you put a needle into the lung cavity and the lung gets air in it and traps the lung. And I learned this when I was a resident. If you haven't had a pneumothorax yet, you just haven't placed enough central lines. It'll happen, give it time. And then bleeding, because when bleeding happens with the central lines, usually the subclavian vessel or the internal jugular vein that's bleeding, those are very hard to control. Versus with a pick, you basically compress the arm against the humerus so you can stop bleeding very easily. So there's a lot of advantages to using this device. They're also economically very attractive. We live in a very cost-conscious era, right? So there was a time when Georgianne would stay in the hospital for weeks getting nutrition until she could go home. But now we can send her home with this device to get early treatment. We can send people to extended care facilities, to nursing homes, where they can continue antibiotics and get them out of the hospital earlier. And because these are largely placed by nursing-led teams, there's no physician time for insertion, so they're actually cheaper to put in than other devices. 
This is my favorite one. Patients love them. So if you Google the word pick and patient today, this is what you'll see. You'll see pictures of patients very happily sharing their lines. And they come in all shapes and sizes, by the way, these patients, um, because they're leaving the hospital, they're going home, no one's sticking them with needles for blood draws, and they're able to get treatment in an environment where they're comfortable, right? So why then be picky? What's the big deal, right? The big deal is complications. Uh, and Georgian's story is illustrative. When I started this work back in the day, everyone thought picks were safer than central lines. My work is really focused on elucidating this risk, quantifying this risk. And the two big complications are blood clots, as Georgian had, but also bloodstream infection uh, with these catheters. There's a bigger problem here. How do we make decisions about what IV catheter a patient should get? So I have got a news flash for you. This is the most common invasive procedure performed in human beings today is inserting an IV device. It is. You walk into the ER with a cold or a, or a, or a back pain, you're gonna get an IV catheter because that's what they do, right? And the evidence for choosing what catheter you should get, who should put it in, where it should go, let me tell you how it works. It's the way we do it, right? We find the biggest, juiciest vein we can find and we get access in you because that's what we do. And when we do surveys of hospitals and we ask them, how do you make decisions? What we hear is, it's just the way our practice has changed. It's our culture. It's our norm. But you dig deeper and you say, why? Why is it that you do it that way? And you understand that there is no vascular access one-on-one course in medical schools. I was never taught this stuff. We learn it as we go along. And yet we order these devices every single day like we know exactly what they are. We know exactly what they're going to do to patients. And if you look deeper at the evidence, you realize it's actually totally fragmented, right? Who owns this problem? Is it surgeons who place the device? Is it oncologists who give chemotherapy through it? Uh, is it the infusion nurse that inserts the device? Is it the critical care physician who puts them in the ICU? It's all over the place. So if I were to summarize all of this in one word, I would say how we make decisions about these devices is suboptimal. True story, I gave a talk about this uh, and somebody sent me a t-shirt with the word suboptimal on it to wear, um, but it is true. It is suboptimal for the most commonly performed procedure in medical patients today. That is why in 2015, I decided to do something about it. And so we published this paper called the Michigan Appropriateness Guide for Intravenous Catheters, something we fondly call magic. We can talk about how I came up with that name later. I promise there was a lot of alcohol involved when we were thinking about these names. Um, but what magic was, was a method. It was a way to think about when you should versus should not use an IV catheter. We use something called the RAND UCLE methodology. This is a modified Delphi method that's actually used by CMS and payers. It's actually very helpful when the evidence is scattered the way it is for vascular catheters. Uh, I put together 15 people from all across the world. And because the evidence was not great, I included a patient panelist. That was Georgian. Uh, she was on our panel. It was great when she turned to the surgeon on the left and said, do you want that procedure done to you? Uh, as a way of thinking about the evidence and implementing it to patients. Uh, and we develop criteria for every single IV device in terms of how you should use it. Uh, there's a lot of strings to magic. It's robust in terms of its methods. It has very relevant recommendations for various patient groups, for example, in, in cancer patients or in the intensive care unit. It is a tool that you can use to benchmark and evaluate how hospitals or teams are performing. And it has very specific clinical guidance for clinicians. So it actually does inform you at the point of care when you're thinking about what device to use. But the question that I have, and the one I'm gonna share with you today is, does implementation of this tool lead to what it's supposed to do, make things more appropriate and actually reduce complications? Can it prevent harm from happening? So this is where uh, our study comes in. So what did we do to actually assess this? Uh, I work with a incredible living lab. This is called the Hospital Medicine Safety Consortium. What is this? It's 69 hospitals and growing now, funded by Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Blue Care Network of, of Michigan. Uh, and what these hospitals do is they come together to focus on key quality areas and safety areas. And one of the key areas is vascular access. Uh, it's actually incredible. You walk down the highway, you drive down the highway, you'll see two boards for two hospitals basically competing for patients. But yet when we enter in the room, we're talking about the same thing and sharing very deep, dark, dirty secrets about our problems in terms of quality and safety. It is a pay for performance model, which is why hospitals get very excited to be participants in this area. And hospitals actually get free resources. They get an individual to collect data manually 
from electronic medical records. So we actually get very granular information about catheters and choices and things that happen to an individual patient. So we can study things like patterns of use, like appropriateness of use and clinical outcomes. We used all of our hospitals to participate in a pay for performance intervention that was aimed at improving catheter use and outcomes. And everything was centered on magic. And the idea was that we were going to target three criteria for improvement. Those three criteria here on the bottom. So we, we first focused on short-term use of catheters. These are areas where there are other safer choices available, and you should not be using those catheters. So that picks less than five days. We focused on inappropriate use. This is where we know the evidence suggests you should not be using these catheters in these patients, and that's in chronic kidney disease patients, because when you put a pick in those vessels, you can never actually access those veins well for fistula or for dialysis access, so it has life-limiting implications for using that catheter. And we focus on complications. And the big factor in complications is how many lumens your catheter has. And if I were to go back and do Georgian all over again, I would have used a single lumen catheter. The more of the lumens, the more of the risk. How do we do this? We created a toolkit for how you should implement magic. That toolkit had an online learning platform, which by the way, is now freely available to everyone. That platform had educational materials. It has videos, it has reference materials. It has sample order sets for how things should be done in the hospital. It's got protocols, it's got policies, it's got even epic tools like best practice alerts that hospitals can download and plug and play into their system. We provided hospitals with access to subject matter experts, not just me, but people from across the world for help with various issues. We held quarterly meetings across all of our hospitals where every site came together. We shared data and our best practices. Uh, and then we provide hospitals with targeted feedback on how they were doing on those three metrics. A trend over time, are you getting better? Are you getting worse? How do you compare relative to your other hospitals around you? And this was all available, by the way, online, anytime they wanted. It was basically a login and a password for them to see their performance as well. That toolkit had a lot of cool things on it. One of them was this, this guy talking about Clabsy. Um, there was also sort of step-by-step -step guides, and these are screenshots from the toolkit, so you can see what was in there. Very, very intense in terms of resources and tools, decision tools, uh, evidence-based criteria, and hospitals could go in and just download and use and pick and take and apply and implement whatever they thought was the best. And we could track it because we were accessing how they were logging in and what they were doing. The key thing with these tools that I want to emphasize is they were completely usable in day-to-day -day practice. I love this on the left. This was created by one of our hospitals. This is a badge card. So you print this out. It goes behind your badge. And it's basically got magic on the back in a card. So you can use it every single day. A lot of our work was around risk-related uh, prediction tools. And so a lot of the tools that were created also were trying to figure out how to use these risk tools in real life. And you can see an example of that here on the right, which is the Michigan risk score for thrombosis with these catheters. So very practical, very pragmatic, and very usable to individual hospitals. We wanted to study this rigorously. So this is where I talk about implementation science. Uh, we used a type one hybrid effectiveness model with facilitated implementation. This is a model where we study the study. We wanna understand what works, what doesn't, and why. So how did this work? So we sat at the coordinating center at the University of Michigan. Uh, at the coordinating center, we had specific jobs, collecting the data, doing the analyses, creating the online learning platform and updating it, benchmarking hospitals and telling them where they were, giving them access to me and many other people across the country, and then holding these quarterly meetings and giving them feedback on their data and performance. We partnered with these hospitals out in Michigan in the community, and they would come back to us with questions about implementation. Hey, how do you do this? You said X, but how does that look in real life. Uh, we have some problems. Our radiology docs are saying no to this. How do we handle that? Um, can you clarify your data and what this means for us? Uh, and can you come to our site and just talk to our residents because we just can't get them to say yes? So this type of stuff, real world barriers that were coming back to us. And we would in turn get those comments back at the coordinating center, go back to our data collection platform and engage with sites one on one. This is very intensive work, right? You need a whole team of people to be able to pull this off the ground but that's how it worked. What do we tell the hospitals to do? So let me walk you through what hospitals were charged with. So each of these hospitals obviously were coming back to us with questions, but we gave them very specific expectations. The first expectation was you had to have a group of people who were responsible for this. So we asked every hospital to convene what we called a vascular access committee to review their data and to look at how they were performing. When they convened that committee, we gave them guidance on who should be on that committee for your site. Uh, what should your monthly data review look like? What should you be talking about? 
usually fallouts and why they were fallouts, so doing more in-depth case reviews, and what should your action plans be? And we collected these every month. So I have minutes and minutes and minutes of data from every hospital. They had to use magic. That was non-negotiable. So they had to use that as a tool. And then we gave them electronic order templates, uh, process maps, workflows, things that they could use to actually do the implementation. Keep in mind, some of these hospitals hadn't done anything of this sort before. So it really was working uh, from the ground up. And then we give them our three targets, reducing your short-term use, increasing your single lumen catheters, and avoiding placement in patients with CKD. And for that, we give them policies and protocols, all the educational materials you saw on the online platform. We shared success. That's a very powerful way to get hospitals encouraged and say, a hospital across the street from you is just as small or large as you are, and this is what they did. Why don't you do that? Uh, we were very, very intentional about engaging subspecialists because we recognize often decisions happen in those spheres. Uh, and then we actually worked on skilling their teams so that they could put in different devices. Big barrier was our teams just can't put in other devices. And so we provided them with training and resources. Again, very intense work uh, at the hospital level. Uh, let me share with you our statistical analyses. Uh, we use a quasi-experimental study design, so a pre-post study. Uh, we collected data for three years as a pre-period, and then the intervention was over three years. So a six-year period for our intervention. Uh, we use multi-level mixed effects logistic regression models, accounting for the clustered nature of the data to look specifically at the odds of an adverse event. And then because we want to look at change over time, we use mixed effects Poisson models We're using count data to understand the rate of adverse events. These models were fully adjusted for patient covariates, for device covariates, and for hospital level characteristics. And again, because we were collecting data manually, we had very specific data. I could tell you the BMI of every single individual in our database uh, at that level of granularity. So very powerful models. And then we expressed our results as odds ratios and interval rate ratios with 95% confidence intervals where appropriate. So that's the study, that's the design. Let me share with you what happened, the results. So when we collected data for six years, we had 46,611 unique catheters from 38,592 unique patients. This is the beauty of this model, is we collect data so quickly across so many sites that we have very large sample sizes very, very quickly. Uh, a few patient characteristics. These are a classic inpatient hospital population on the medicine side. So most of them were men, median age was 64, and most of them had three or more comorbidities in terms of by being in the hospital. Um, the top three indications for the use of the catheters was IV antibiotics in 54%. I'm looking at Christine. This is where the ID docs come in. Uh, difficult access means the hospital could not actually get a catheter in them. Uh, so 20% of patients. And then the Georgian scenario where you needed to give somebody a centrally active medication like nutrition and you needed central venous access in about 10% of our patients. And the median duration of catheter use ranged widely. So some hospitals, nine days, other hospitals, 33 days. Uh, so think about that, half below, half above. Incredible variation. This is a health services researcher's dream, right? Because you've got so much variability in how these devices are being used. What's the baseline situation look like? So this is the first three years of data. Pre-intervention, the baseline frequency of inappropriate use was 31%. One in three catheters was going in because they were in, they were actually not appropriate in these patients. If you look at where they were most inappropriate, it largely was those multi-lumen catheters, but also a fair proportion of, of catheters going in for short periods where, again, you could use a totally different device that may have a better safety profile. And look at that chronic kidney disease. Like, we know we shouldn't be doing this. And yet, you know, 20% of our patients, do the math, 10,000 patients in this database were getting catheters that were otherwise inappropriate. Complications didn't track far behind. A pre intervention, 15% of patients had a major complication. Uh, you can see the three down there that we tracked. Occlusion was the most common one. We think this is major because it's often a signal of infection and or complications coming downstream. But 3% of them had blood clots, like Georgian did, and about 2% had bloodstream infections. These are very costly and very morbid complications. So, again, room for improvement. Uh, this bar graph is interesting, so let me walk you through it. This is a snap, a random sample of our hospitals just to show you what appropriateness looks like. So each of the vertical bars here is a hospital. The orange color is the appropriateness of their catheter use in 2015. The blue is in 2019 stacked above them. So essentially, you want to see hospitals get better. And you can see here, Hospital 822, not a lot of stuff they were doing back in the day was appropriate, but they really improved dramatically. Other hospitals had more modest improvements here and here, for example, and this hospital got worse. Why do they get worse? Because their entire quality team got 
I don't know the words not fired, but uh, got removed from the business. And you can, this is actually proof positive of why quality matters. The moment you take the people away, the work actually suffers. So to make this quantitative and a little bit more easy to digest, uh, overall appropriateness improved from 31% to 48% uh, across hospitals. Uh, and the range of improvement varied from minus 12% all the way up to 54% across sites. Uh, if you are thinking like I'm thinking, you're probably wondering why did some hospitals get so much better and some got worse. And that's something we're actually studying right now. And, and this is the trend over time, looking at quarters worth of data. So you can see where we started, it was pretty, poor and where we are now, we're actually over 65% in appropriateness across our hospitals over time. Great work, but still has um, opportunity for improvement. What about complications? Same type of random sample. This is the other way around now. Orange is basically complications in 2015. You want to see that go down, so blue is better. And you can see here across the group, the complications declined dramatically. Uh, if you do the numbers, uh, essentially major complications decreased an average of 40% across hospitals, uh, VTE by about 35%, bloodstream infection by 37%, and occlusion by 40%. And this was all highly statistically significant in terms of differences in complications. So some real opportunity. But, uh, and here's the trend over time, and you can see the complication rates drop, which is exactly what we had hoped for uh, in our work. But the question I have is, what does this have to do with appropriateness? Does it make a difference if you're appropriate or not? So we just published this paper in BMJ Quality and Safety. This was just last year. And what I'll show you here essentially is if you look at a catheter that's placed for appropriate reasons, your rates of occlusion were about 3.7%. But if it was placed for inappropriate reasons, your complications were four times higher, 12%. Uh, if you look at bloodstream infection, CLABSI, 0.9% uh, if you're actually appropriate versus 2.09% if you are inappropriate, according to MAGIC. Um, and VTE, same thing, 1.4 versus 3.94%. And you can see the odds here of the, the, the value of using magic because you essentially decrease your complications overall by almost 71% when the catheters are placed for appropriate reasons according to this, this structure. So powerful data. Uh, for every 1% increase in appropriateness in a hospital, your major complications decline at a rate of 0.33. Um, and that is fairly significant in the quality improvement world. There's very few things that actually have that degree of impact. Uh, so if you drew the figures, that's what it looks like. Your green is your appropriateness goes up over time and your complications drop over time as well. Why does this matter? Why does Blue Cross Blue Shield support this work? So each of these humanoids is 10 people. Uh, if you do the math, uh, we had just 450, this is just DVT, 459 fewer blood clots uh, in these patients uh, over time. Uh, if you look at the cost of a clot, it's about $11,000. So we saved about $5 million alone for a DVT. If you do the same for CLABSI and for inclusion, you can see how quickly these numbers add up. So the reason insurance companies are so, so interested in this is because they figured out it's cheaper to avoid a complication than pay for it not to mention it's the right thing to do for patient care. So it's a unique model in that sense as well. And this makes me very happy when I think about Georgian and how my journey started. Uh, we are doing some, some good work here to help people in this process. Magic has caught fire. These are hospitals and health systems where I know it's being used as their policy. Um, there's a different color in Colorado because it's recently changed, uh, which I'm happy to, to know about. And it's happening across the world. These are hospitals where governments, where payers have essentially mandated the use of appropriateness criteria such as magic to be used for the vascular access decision making. Uh, and so some strengths and limitations about this work. Uh, first, the strengths, this is really large scale. It's really real world messy implementation data, but it translates something that's very abstract in evidence into real world practice. Uh, we use very rigorous methodology, uh, grounded in implementation theory. So we link this theoretical construct of appropriateness into real world patient outcomes, including CLABS, VTE, and occlusion. Um, our findings are encouraging. They suggest that hospitals can actually do this. You can reduce major complications by using tools like magic, and that has cost, morbidity, mortality, and safety implications. And then our strategy, our toolkit, it's all available online now. It's all free. And so you can actually get in and log in and use this stuff to actually do your work, even if you're not part of HMS or part of the collaborative going forward. There are some threats though, and I wanna call these out very specifically. First and foremost, this was observational, right? So I don't really know if there's other unmeasured confounding going on. Uh, we used average effects over time. So as you know, individual hospitals had variable effect as well. Um, we had very highly engaged hospitals. I mean, it's a lot of them, but they're getting paid to do this. And so the question is, if hospitals aren't necessarily seeing a financial upside, 
Will this be reproducible or not? Stay tuned. We're doing this in the Kaiser system now across 180 Kaiser hospitals. Uh, my hope is that we'll see the same upside, but we'll find out. Uh, and I don't really know what hospitals did on the ground. This is the part that really gets me excited. What happened? Uh, and what was the most effective ingredient of the intervention? Lots of pieces to this, right? Very hard to do. If we can isolate maybe the top two or three things that make the most difference, that might make it easy for hospitals to buy into this. So we're finishing up our qualitative data analysis from sites. We have uh, actually looked at sites that did not so good, sites that did fairly good, and sites that did very good to understand what differences there are across hospitals as well. So stay tuned for those data. What's next is to do it here, to do it in Colorado, make magic in Colorado. Uh, UC Health has recognized the importance of this. We actually have a system-wide initiative here now focusing on bloodstream infections that I'm a part of. Uh, magic will be a key component of this, it already is uh, in many of our order sets, but we're gonna have appropriate selection of catheters, standardized toolkits, uh, uniform protocols for implementation, and then benchmarking of data, just as we did it at Michigan, but to do it here, to do it locally, to do it for the patients that come for care to our system. So how do you do this? Uh, how do you apply magic? Um, well, uh, there's an app for that. So this is the part where you take out your phones and point it to the screen and take pictures. Um, but that QR code will take you to the iOS store if you're an Apple user. If you're an Android user, you look for Michigan Magic. Don't look for Magic because you'll get the Disney app, which is great, but that's not what you want right now. And the Magic app basically walks you through the actual intervention. So it starts off with asking which of the following indications are you ordering a pick for? Let's just say I choose IV antibiotics. That's the most common indication. The next question is, did you talk to your ID colleagues? because about a third of catheters go in without ID even knowing about them, turns out. Uh, if the answer is no, it kicks you right back. If the answer is yes, it asks you, is it peripherally compatible? Do you need a central line like a PIC? Could you use something else? I don't remember what's peripherally compatible, but there's a list right there you can click on, walks you through the drugs that you can use and not use. The next question is, what's your duration of treatment and how long do you wanna give therapy for? So I say five days. And here's the catheters you should be able to use. This, by the way, is completely now implemented in Epic. And so it should be able to walk you through the decisions when you're ordering catheters for your patients as well. So the key takeaways from my talk are that decisions about IV access, again, the most commonly used procedure in the world, can be improved using criteria such as MAGIC. Uh, in this study, implementation of MAGIC led to substantial improvement in pick appropriateness and reduction in complications. And I think broader use and external validation appears necessary. Um, I told Georgian yesterday that I was gonna show her picture. I always tell her that. And she sent me a text and she said, um, please make magic in Colorado. Patients like me would be very grateful. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Thanks very much. Happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. So for those online who couldn't hear it, uh, Dr. Scott asks, uh, how do we establish the initial relationship with the payers? Well, I have um, Dr. Peter Pronovos to thank for this, actually. So some of you may know the Keystone study for bloodstream infection safety was done at Michigan. And Peter and his colleagues from Hopkins did a lot of the groundwork that basically said, give us a chance to actually improve this for you from a quality and safety perspective. Keystone was funded locally uh, to do this work and build hospitals and come together on a smaller scale, but it was proof of concept for the Michigan Hospital Association and for the payers. And when we saw the impact we saw in the New England Journal and the effect worldwide, it was sort of an easier ask. Michigan has a very rich history of this type of innovation and collaboration. Uh, I have started conversations with payers here to try to have the same type of impact. Turns out a payer is not the same as another payer. Uh, even blues across different states have very different budgets and very different sort of interests. Uh, but those conversations hopefully will go somewhere here as well. Uh, when Peter brought it to Michigan's attention, uh, it was a, an environment where there was the uh, appetite to try some of this intelligent risk taking. I really wish there were more of it, but I'm hoping to have those conversations here. That's a great question. I can't take credit for it. Is there a question in the back? Okay. Thanks, Natalie. So we have a question about uh, from David Beckelman. How did you fund the development of your app? 
Oh, good question. So Dr. Beckham, I will tell you that I can code in Swift. And I'm happy to help you with that. Um, it was me and a med student. And actually, I have to give credit to the med student. The med student said, Dr. Chopra, no one's ever going to read this 150-page appropriateness document you put together. It's a great read for plane rides because you'll go to sleep, but it's not going to be used at the bedside. So I said, well, how do we do it? He said, well, you got to build an app. Uh, and so we started to actually learn how to code. It's not hard. If you can code in Stata, you can code in Swift uh, is the way I would sort of frame it. Now, you may not be able to code in Stata, and then you need help. Um, I would say go to your medical students and your residents. You'd be surprised at how much talent is out there. Um, we we literally built the app in a week, uh, and it was not hard to do once we figured out the flow and the way things needed to kind of work together, which is where I think I provided most of the input. There are a lot of these templates and app builders online that you can use to actually do all the other work as well. So uh, it was funded with exactly zero dollars, uh, but a lot of sweat equity. Oh, and I should tell you, it's been downloaded almost 100,000 times already. I wish I charged 99 cents for an app. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but it's free. And that's why I think it's been it's been great to actually have uptick. Thanks for that question. We have another question from David Schwartz. He says, great work, really important contribution. Congratulations. So what do you think are some similar common procedures that also need such an evaluation as this? Oh, yeah. Great question. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. It's very kind uh, coming from you, especially. Um, many other procedures. You know, I stumbled on PICS because as a hospitalist, I was ordering these devices every day. Um, I wanted something for research that I could own, I could call mine. Uh, and I recognized that funding for the work I wanted to do was going to be very competitive unless there was something that I could really hone in on. There's a lot of things out there that are very similar in terms of that model. Um, there's a lot of work happening now in the antibiotic stewardship space that I think is very similar around thinking about appropriateness of antibiotic use. Uh, there's similar work happening for procedures such as low value procedures around stress tests and cardiovascular disease, MRIs for low back pain, for example. Those are well-worn paths. I think areas that are less well-worn are around the spaces of therapeutics. Uh, I often wonder why we use the drugs we use. Uh, and why we make the choices we make around certain therapies, especially when two or more drugs are actually fairly equivalent in terms of the evidence. So I think there's opportunity there to guide us on appropriateness. I also think there's opportunities there to unpack the cost implications of things, which often drive these decisions as well. Um, but I, I think there's a lot out there. And one of the joys of meeting with mentees is talking about the, exactly this question, which is what else would be out there that we could work on together? So if you can do it for catheters, you can do it for every for a lot of other things. But thank you, Dr. Schwartz. That's great. Great. Thanks all. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dr. Chopra. Um, I think we now come to the awards part of our um, of our day. So let me queue up our slides here. Um, so the first award that we wanted to announce. Um, I believe is our, our mentoring award. Um, so it's my pleasure and privilege thank you, to announce uh, Dr. Jane Roosh from the Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism and Diabetes as the recipient of the 2022 Department of Medicine Mentoring Award. I'm choking up because she's done a lot for me. <laughs> um, it's really great to, I, I didn't nominate her, but um, I'm so glad that she's won. Um, I'll share a few excerpts from her mentoring accomplishments from her nomination letter. On our campus, Dr. Roosh co-built career development programs to the CCTSI, Center for Women's Health Research, and the Dean's Women in Medicine and Science Office. Of her 30 to 40 primary mentees over the past 25 years, a vast majority remain in academic medicine, and impressively, seven are full professors and nine are associate professors. Few people have, have that impressive a track record. Beyond our campus, Dr. Roosh conceived of and implemented the Women's Interprofessional Network of the ADA, or WIN ADA. She saw a mentoring need, envisioned a solution, and then championed the program, giving voice and guidance to hundreds of scientists and physicians in research and clinical care. While Jane has mentioned, mentored so many one-on-one, -on -one, this program has assisted the career development of individuals whom Jane has never met. It's a shining example of Jane's mentoring legacy. I'll close with a final excerpt from her nom nomination letter from Dr. Haugen. 
I've worked closely with Dr. Roosh for the last three decades, and she's not only an outstanding clinician scientist and national leader, Jane is arguably the best mentor I've ever seen. Not only is her ability to design and carry out impactful research outstanding, she's easily able to teach this to many others and instill in them her infectious enthusiasm for academic medicine and research. I couldn't agree more. Obviously, I'm moved by this and um, have been the beneficiary of all of this. So congratulations and thanks for your efforts, Dr. Roosh. So I don't know if I'm actually supposed to say something. So Sri said I was, so I, I will. Um, first off, it is easy to mentor when you have the world's best job. I absolutely uh, love being a physician scientist. I discovered early in my career that there were too few people, too few physicians, uh, straight MD scientists moving into research. And I had the early experience of collaborating with PhD scientists and learning that together we asked better questions. I also had the privilege to learn through the CCTSI leadership programs and the executive leadership in academic medicine that leadership and mentoring skills can be taught, that you can actually teach these skills and help people who want also to have the world's best job to succeed, to be proud in their success and to bring others with them. And I am so touched to get a mentoring award. It's kind of a weird year. I, um, I, I've had a couple local mentoring awards and um, this year is uh, a, a crazy year where I have won the uh, Endocrine Society Mentoring Award, um, an international mentoring award, the American Diabetes Association, Albert Renault Award, and the Mayo Soli Mentoring Award, which means so much to me because um, the Carmel meetings are specifically oriented for physician scientists, and that means so much to me. But perhaps this award to be recognized locally is something that so seldom happens, and I really appreciate it, and I'm very touched, and I, I just have the world's best job, so thank you very much. Congratulations again. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, our abstract award winners. These were selected by a fairly large pool of abstracts submitted and reviewed by the Outstanding Early Career Scholars. And our award winners this year are Amar Arar, Rhiannon Atwater, Paulo Burke, Nikita Deng, Ilaria Ferrari, Kurt Fried, Austin Jolly, Sija Lu, Marissa Martin, Julie Resselam, Marcello Rubino, and David Woods. Congratulations. You'll be receiving a certificate from the Department of Medicine as well as a small gift. And then we'll now move on to lunch, uh, which will be available in the back and we'll resume around noon, okay? Yeah. Let me just make sure you have the keynote. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, well, I hope everyone is able to pick up some lunch and get settled. I'm Christine Swanson. I'm an endocrinologist here at CU, um, and I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Cliff Rosen. It's difficult to keep his list of accolades and achievements brief, but I will try. Um, he is currently a professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine and a senior scientist at Maine Medical uh, Center, where he is also the director of the Center for Clinical and Translational Research. His research interests include the genetic regulation of IGF-1 relative to skeletal metabolism, parathyroid hormone as an anabolic therapy, and the relationship between marrow adipogenesis and osteoblastogenesis. His lab uses age, genetic, environmental, diet, and pharmacologic manipulations to understand the complex regulation of bone remodeling using a variety of investigational techniques. He is a very collaborative investigator and has over 391 peer-reviewed publications on basic translational and clinical research topics. 
He's published his own original research and numerous invited commentaries and reviews in some lesser known journals like New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, JCI Insight, Cell, PNAS, and Nature. Um, he has led a very successful career as a physician scientist by any metric um, and has had a significant impact on research and clinical medicine through many of his positions, including a member of the FDA of several FDA advisory boards, chair of several NIH study sections, the chair of the 2019 Postmenopausal Osteoporosis Endosociety Guidelines, a past president of ASBMR, and served as an associate editor of the New England Journal of Medicine since 2014. Despite all of this, he still has time to be an extraordinary mentor to local and distant MD and PA PhD investigators at all career stages, and is always willing to share his extensive knowledge and expertise to improve the research and careers of junior and peer investigators. He will share some of his very successful journey in academic medicine with us today in his talk, The Road Well Traveled, From Student to Mentor and the Obstacles in Between. Thanks, Thanks Christine. It's great to be here. I, I won't use the podium. Um, and um, I'd like to start by just giving you a little, this is our lab. This is somebody who took a picture I've been running every day for 40 years. Uh, I'm sure the form's not very good. And this is uh, in the Boston Marathon in which I died at uh, 20 miles. <laughs> and just to show you that there are obstacles consistently in our lives, but you can overcome them. I happen to have had a vertebral fracture from overtraining um, uh, and losing weight, and uh, which you know, I'm sure that I can't afford to. And uh, I developed a vertebral fracture, which piqued my interest in a subject that we're going to talk about at the end, and that is calorie restriction. Okay, so my conflicts are New England Journal um, uh, as an associate editor, up to date as a senior editor, uh, but I don't take any other uh, financial uh, gifts. So I'm gonna talk about three stories. And this was a very hard talk for me to put together. And I spent months on it. And actually the most recent edition on my slip disc is 7.37 AM this morning after I got back from my run and I made other edits. And uh, so I think it's nine versions from the one I sent last week in hopes of keeping it just in case there was a crash. So it was very difficult and I hope that it turns out the way uh, I want it to. But I thought I would give three stories about my work and some of both the mentors that I value so much and then the obstacles that occurred during the course of my um, study and uh, publications. In the maze of IGFs, I'll talk about NIH funding uh, and then the, the difficulties of translating bench to bed bedside. In this part of the talk, vitamin D, I'm gonna talk about what it's like to be opposed to your mentor, what it's like to, to work for somebody and to have somebody who helped you through your career, then take an opposing side to a scientific argument and what that meant to my relationship with him and also what it meant to the science of vitamin D. And in addition, the second obstacle was challenging misinformation. Uh, and then finally, the mystery of marrow fat. And it starts with a story about uh, bears, and it ends with uh, my continued question about why evolution is such an interesting and exciting aspect of science that we still don't understand. Okay, so I was very uh, young. I was not quite 17 when I started college, and I went to the University of Maine. I'm only going to give you a very, very brief anecdote about my early student part of this talk. And I was very fortunate in that um, I got to work at the University of Maine Library, which is up here, and to meet two very important and distinguished people who were not very important or distinguished when I met them. Uh, it was a time of tremendous campus upheaval. And we uh, were focusing daily on the main campus where we both worked and read uh, and wondered what was happening at other campuses around the, the country. And of course, nobody was studying, so that was that. So one of the persons who we read every day was a person who uh, had a narrative called King's Garbage Truck. And what it was was a stream of consciousness about life in, at the University of Maine and about the 60s, I was in SDS, I was picketing on grapes, and I 
go to the king's garbage truck and try to figure out what are we doing and how are we doing it and really are we making our way? Well, as it turned out, this distinguished person was Stephen King. And as a individual who was working in the library, I got to know both Steve and Tabitha. And this anecdote really is about persistence. And what it's about is the fact that when Steve graduated, he went to work at New Franklin Laundry, which is in downtown Bangor, and then got his teacher certificate and decided to teach uh, English. At the time, he had already written some short stories and he had sent some stuff to the English department where he majored. And they told him, get lost. This is really nothing that anybody would be interested in, let alone people like you. And it wasn't until three years later on a certain day where one of our friends was a student in his class, when he walked into his high school English class and said, I've just got my book, Carrie, published. Goodbye, I'm leaving. And that was the start of his career. And what happened to the University of Maine was very intriguing. They refused to recognize Stephen's uh, influence on modern literature. And it wasn't until 2001, 30 years later, that they decided to do a Stephen King Day and endow a professorship 30 years later after many, many publications. So what did they do? They decided to bring together the rabble rousers of the 1960s and we sat on a stage and we talked about what it was like to, uh, to be in the 60s in, at the University of Maine. And the story behind it is just that sometimes we think that our institutions don't recognize us or don't serve us well, or don't give us enough. And the truth of the matter is, just be persistent, because as you accomplish in your life, you'll recognize these things. Okay, so I, I went through an undistinguished career. I went to Syracuse for medical school, and luckily, because I was so poor, they paid for my tuition for all four years, which they don't do anymore. But all I had to do was say, I'm not supported by my parents, and they paid my tuition. When I went to do a residency, I was very insecure, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do in medicine. So I ended up at a small hospital in Western Massachusetts and, and as part of UMass and did a residency and chief residency. Did three years of uh, private practice, and then went to Dartmouth to do uh, my fellowship, research fellowship. And there I am up there with that big Afro, if you can recognize. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, during that time, I studied the role of prolactin in regulating bone mass under the influence of uh, Bob Adler and some other senior mentors. Uh, and following that, I came back to Maine, and I got on the faculty at the University of Maine and also worked uh, as a uh, endocrinologist at uh, St. Joseph's Hospital in Bangor. So my research career really began with uh, a trip to uh, Zimbabwe. So one of my colleagues, uh, Peter Millard, uh, was there for five years at the border between Mozambique and Zimbabwe. And that just declared its independence in 1980. And so we traveled there to work in his hospital in Mount Salinda, and we saw much of uh, the disease that had disappeared in other countries. So scarlet fever and, and uh, um, typhoid fever and multiple tragedies and difficulties. Beautiful country, beautiful wildlife, a culture from Mount, uh, in old Zimbabwe that dated back to the 1300s that were on, only just beginning to become apparent that Western civilization uh, was not the founding component in Africa, but rather their own civilizations. But what struck me was um, the children, the undernourished children who all came in with high glucoses. And when I went to um, give a talk at Harare, the capital, my talk was on microadenomas. And I quickly realized that who cared about microadenomas in a country like Mount Salinda and Zimbabwe, where undernourishment and malnutrition, protein calorie malnutrition was severe. And I wanted to try to understand what was the mechanism of hyperglycemia during the time that these children were malnourished. 
And so I became, became interested in IGF. So uh, insulin-like growth factor one was originally discovered as somatomedin C as this factor that was isolated from the circulation uh, in response to, to growth hormone by uh, Dougherty and uh, Salmon back in the 1950s. And it wasn't until the early and mid 1970s that we began to un understand and isolate uh, IGF-1 as a single peptide of seven kilodaltons that was directly mediated by uh, growth hormone. And so in my simple mind, uh, after uh, talking with Dave Clements and, and discussing malnutrition and undernutrition and the fact that IGF-1 levels went down with um, calorie restriction, that these, those children had low IGFs, had less insulin response, and maybe that's what was the mechanism of tropical diabetes. Of course, that wasn't the case, but that started me thinking about what did we need to understand about IGFs? And so we, I came back from Africa and we set up an assay laboratory for IGF-1. It was very difficult to measure IGF-1. The antibody wasn't very good. And there was all this interfering substances. So uh, at the time we didn't know what they were, but we began to characterize the IGF binding proteins that were interfering. And we initially, uh, us and many other groups, uh, characterized six IGF binding proteins. And what was tricky about the IGF binding proteins is that they bound very tightly to IGF-1, so tightly that they actually prevented IGF-1, they had greater binding affinity than did IGF-1 for its receptor. And that caused a number of different questions to occur. What was the function of these IGF binding proteins? And as the field advanced, and it was a dramatic field, and Maggie can probably remember as well, that we used to have whole days at Endocrine Society on some means and IGFs. We don't see it at all anymore. There's some uh, discovery in IGF receptors for cancer, but really uh, the whole field went so quickly and a lot of things got discovered. And one was that, yes, it could bind IGFs and prevent IGF from getting to the receptor, it could also serve as a fragment that is cleaved by proteases, allowing the IGF to get to the receptor more easily. It could actually carry IGF to the receptor and activate it, or uh, it could work in a totally different fashion. Uh, that is that the binding protein has its own receptor for IGF. So those four sort of possibilities made things very difficult. And what I learned through a lot of hard work and frustration was that when you enter the IGF field, you enter a maze. And as you enter it, you, can't, you cannot find the ending because you see IGF binding proteins, you see IGF receptors, you see all the tissue specificity. But what we learned is that the IGF binding proteins are an essential part of the IGFs. And I also learned to be very close with Dave Clements, my uh, senior partner who helped me sort of begin the navigation of that maze. And he continues to be an inspiration. And as I told Maggie, we chatter on the phone and by text with the game tonight, I'm sure we'll be talking. And on Saturday where he told me, and I was very buoyed by this, I'm too nervous to talk. <laughs> so, uh, so and, and he said, and this is really true because I know him well, is that the only thing that counts is beating Duke. Anybody who's been to North Carolina knows that beating Duke is much more relevant. At any rate, so I wrote my first R01, uh, not with David, by myself. Um, I decided to put my foot in the water and I was interested in IGF binding protein for its relationship to aging and in particular to age-related osteoporosis. So I got this pink sheet back and it was just horrible. So who is this investigator? We, you can't do this work in Maine. The environment, almost everybody does well with environment. Well, I did terrible with environment. Um, and um, who is the mentor and support structure? Well, I didn't have any because I didn't know what I was doing. And then what happens? So I had this great plan that we would actually isolate 
IGFBP4, get the protein, and then make an antibody and actually develop. And we, we actually had a great assay, which uh, some people still use, but it takes a lot longer uh, to do it, that we can actually pull down the binding proteins by adding IGF2 to the serum. So we just measured IGF-1, the IGF-2 soaks up the binding protein. It's brilliant, but nobody really got that excited about it. Anyways, um, so I got a 390. In those days, there were three digits. Um, that's not, a, I, I didn't like that system, and I guess they didn't either. But anyways, uh, then I repeated, and they didn't even discuss it. So I really um, was um, discouraged. And um, I happened to have a PhD student, Lee Ray Donahue, who was my age. So it's not that often that you had a PhD student the same age as the mentor. But uh, she came uh, to work for me uh, and she was interested in IGF binding proteins. And so we published a couple of papers on that and she did beautifully. And then she went to Bar Harbor. She went back to Bar Harbor to do a postdoc. And the reason she did is she had a gift store in Bar Harbor already. And she said, well, I can do a postdoc at the same time I run my gift store. This is Maine. This is very different. Anyways, um, and so she went to the Jackson lab. So she called me up one day and said, Cliff, you have to come to the Jackson lab. And I said, you know, Maine people, uh, it's a little hard to understand that we have a world-class laboratory uh, at the same time, we also have in the same spot as we have a national park. And she said, you got to come down here. You've got to learn mouse biology. And I said, I got my hands full. I'm going all over the state. It's a, a tertiary endocrine referral. We used to fly up to northern Maine. I was scared to death sitting in the plane uh, with thunderstorms and this single four seater, you know. And I said, I, you know, I can't do it. But I decided to go down there. And when I got down there, the first things they made me do is buy, buy this book. They didn't give it to me, called Mouse Genetics. Lee Silver, the classic book in mouse uh, genetics back in the 90s. And the second thing was to take the two-week course, which is the most fantastic course for any of you that are interested in uh, genetics. Two-week course with Hopkins and Jack's uh, faculty that is run in the most beautiful spot in the state of Maine in Acadia. So I did that and I joined a small lab that was studying bone. So as I did that, I decided that I needed a new focus. I needed, if I was going to get funded, I really needed another mentor in bone. And so um, I was interested in IGF binding proteins in, in, in tissue. And so I sought out David Bailink and Loma Linda. Uh, and David said, why don't you come out and spend some time in Loma Linda and learn, really learn bone biology. Don't, you know, don't just say you're gonna do this, but learn it. So I went to his lab several times and uh, it was really a fantastic experience. And I owe a lot to Dave, but he's still uh, in 90, still around and uh, still working in Loma Linda. And what I learned was how to apply genetic approaches to potentially identify jacks. And uh, of course, now I had a real environment, the Jackson Laboratory. So it made things a lot easier for my grant. And I got my first R01 basic grant in 1996. I had already had a couple of clinical R01s on randomized trials for um, uh, osteoporosis. In 2001, uh, I worked with Shoshana Yakar, another one of the people that I worked with that was from long distance. And she came from Israel and was at NIH. And we published uh, probably the first paper on the uh, conditional deletion of IGF-1 in liver, establishing that IGF-1 was an endocrine hormone that as it circulated, it was really important because we were able to show, and Cheryl Ackert, who's here and is a superstar on uh, genetics of bone, was on this publication. She was at, at JAX as my graduate student. Um, showed that when you reduce IGF-1 just in the liver, you get this marked reduction in bone. But we came back to the, the undernutrition, and I'll come back to the undernutrition story again at the end. We came back to the undernutrition because we realized that as IGF-1 went down with calorie restriction in mice, IGF-BP2 went up. And so uh, in collaboration with Dave Clements, we... Uh, uh, identified the, the protein, and uh, we made a, a small uh, 
protein fragment, which we call the heparin binding domain one, because it was a part of the IGFBP that was binding to uh, the matrix of bone. And uh, we made a fragment of that. And with a, a, a very talented graduate student, Victoria DeMambra, we actually were able to condition to globally delete IGFBP2. So we had thought based on what we learned from IGFBP2 that it went up with nutrition, under nutrition as IGF1 went down. And so it must be inhibitory. And like everything in the IGF world, everything you think is right is not right. Uh, because it's usually the opposite. And in fact, when we deleted IGF-BP2, we got a, um, a marked uh, reduction in bone mass, suggesting that IGF-BP2 was actually anabolic for the skeleton. And we went on in several publications to show that IGF-BP2 had anabolic properties. And then more recently, uh, Dave Clements and I showed that using both the heparin binding domain and the, the full molecule, that we were able to show for one of the first times that the IGF binding protein had its own receptor, uh, RPTP beta, and that it worked synergistically with IGF-1 by suppressing P10 and activating the mTOR pathway. So this was fairly dramatic because it provided us with strong evidence that depending on what the level of igf 2 was, you could have an impact on different tissues. And Victoria DeMambra and myself and Dave went on to show that you could actually use igf 2 to block adipogenesis uh, using either the heparin binding domain one or the heparin binding domain two, both of which we made uh, in Dave Clemens' lab. So not only did it have an impact on the skeleton, um, but it also had an impact on fat tissue. And so this is sort of a summary review by one of our competitors who actually gave us credit for what uh, we think is the actions of IGF-BP2 as both either agonists or antagonists, depending on the concentration of both IGF-BP2 and IGF-1. So we went on to pegylate the, the heparin binding domain and move into translational work. And we were able to show that we could, using either the heparin binding domain one or two that was pegylated and stayed in the circulation, that we could in, uh, reduce fat tissue um, in, and reduce our diet-induced obesity at the same time that we increased bone mass. So we were very excited. And we subsequently commercially uh, associated with a French group uh, who then sold their rights to it to uh, Amelot. And just, just within the past week, um, they presented their data to me about the use of IGF-BP2 fragment in the treatment of type 2 sort of type 2 diabetes. These are Zucker rats, uh, ZDSD rats. Uh, uh, in which uh, they found, uh, they were very excited, but when I saw the data, I was very unexcited. <laughs> and it turns out that I had to make the terrible decision that they probably should not go forward with the utilization. It was very hard for me, you know, we've done all that work on BP2 over 30 years to say, gee, commercial, I, I don't think this is gonna work. Um, but this is science. And so even though we didn't, um, we didn't get a product that we can somehow say this is what it was, we've gone on to look at IGF-BP2 in other venues and we've realized that IGF-BP2 actually is one of the most highly upregulated, it is the most highly regulated protein after vertical sleeve gastrectomy. So during the initial stages of weight loss after vertical sleeve gastrectomy, IGF-BP2 is the greatest. And when we took our, we defrosted our old mice with the IGF-BP2 globals knockouts and redid vertical sleeve gastrectomy, uh, we found that we could protect against trabecular bone loss. So it's both an agonist and an antagonist. And very recently in science, we real, uh, worked with the group at uh, Southwestern and showed that IGF-BP2 was probably the key protein in liver regeneration following toxic injury. And that it was uh, 
are expressed by uh, these um, hepatocytes in the mid-lobular zone of two. So stay tuned. I think IGF-BP2 is not dead yet. Um, we won't have a commercial product for treatment, but I think we, we still need better understanding of what that is. Okay, so that's IGF uh, and IGF binding proteins, and I continue to be fascinated by it. But NIH, they funded us one cycle, and then they said, we don't think we're going to give you another five years. So we've been pedaling along, although not with uh, any current funding. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears and talk about a very difficult subject, but one that's near and dear to everybody's heart, and that is vitamin D. So it's a magnificent scientific story, the discovery and the evolution of vitamin D. Uh, there's a massive set of misinformation that I'll talk about. And as I mentioned, a very difficult personal scenario. So in 1988, I was at Maine, and I really missed some of the clinical um, scenarios that were occurring at tertiary hospitals. So I had met Mike at a meeting and he got very interested in me and um, the work we were doing. And so I became an attending at BU and I would go there and spend a month on the wards at the old Boston City Hospital. And Mike and I would hold joint lab meetings in Boston um, uh, to discuss uh, a number of different uh, issues uh, in the laboratory studies. And at the time, Mike was really at the forefront of the vitamin D world. So just to remind you, um, actually rickets were, was first described in 1650. Um, and it was uh, actually in the late eighties that it was discovered that at the end of winter and the beginning of summer, that in the industrialized societies that the less rickets occurred or the rickets that were there were actually getting better. And it was uh, subsequently the work of Holchinsky who showed that artificial UV light back in 1919 could cure rickets. And then irrad irradiated food uh, was shown to also uh, prevent rickets. And during this period of the 30s to the 70s, the identification and discovery of the different vitamin D metabolites was undertaken. And Michael was one of the premier uh, investigators in both the isolation of 125D, although there's some controversy to this day of who got it first, and then also uh, in terms of photosynthesis from the skin. And then a whole series of clinical trials, which I'll come back to. So as you know, vitamin D is made in the skin. Uh, it also can be consumed from diet, uh, and uh, it goes to the liver, it's 25-hydroxylated. And now we think that 25-hydroxyvitamin D has some pro-hormone effect, that's been controversial, but that it then gets converted to 125, not only in the kidney, which has been the traditional thinking, and then circulates as an active hormone 125, but in many, many, many tissues, in fact, virtually every tissue has some one alpha hydroxylase. And of course, vitamin D is really important for bone. And because rickets is a bone disease, it was an easy jump to take vitamin D deficiency in children to vitamin D deficiency in adults and treatment. So when I started some of our work with Michael, I didn't appreciate the globosphere of vitamin D. There were the, the vitamin D council in particular of which I'm enemy number two, I think, um, hates me and they, and they have all this data. You do, uh, it's, it overwhelms the uh, in, internet. Uh, but these are some of the quotes. Vitamin D can benefit for pregnant women. Vitamin D prevents flu. Vitamin D for fertility. And I really wasn't aware of that, nor was I aware of the amount of money that's spent um, uh, talking and uh, speaking for vitamin D. 3.3 billion in 2015. Uh, and this really, and then the in-home test kits, et cetera. So this was really... Uh, uh, a surprise to me. And it wasn't just supplements, it was testing. And testing, it turns out to be is a big business. And so when we test, um, 
and this is so great about Dr. Chopra's talk, is that, you know, a lot of what he talked about applies to vitamin D. So how did it get so widespread attention? Well, one, it's safe. It's easy. You can get over the counter. You can measure it. So if a doc can measure it, you can treat and it gets better. I'm fond of saying that the strongest evidence to date is that if you give vitamin D, you increase vitamin D levels. <laughs> that is the strongest, and that's the only evidence as you'll see. Uh, it's familiar to all providers. It affects all tissues. We did a study in Maine of Medicare providers, and, uh, I mean, of uh, 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 Maine state of providers, Medicaid providers, and less than 10% of the providers that uh, prescribe vitamin D to patients in their, in their well clinic visits Less than 10% were related to skeletal indications. The number one indication, depression. Number two, sleep. So um, anyways, so uh, it affects all tissues. It's big business. And what could be wrong with a vitamin? And particularly what could be wrong because the sun makes it through non-enzymatic conversion. So this led to a plethora of, of guidelines and recommendations about vitamin D. And at the heart of this was this issue because uh, testing is such a big deal um, uh, for hospital labs. So hospital labs make a lot of money by measuring vitamin D. And so one has to decide what is the normal level of vitamin D. And this is where the science starts to become fuzzy. So we know that when levels of 10 nanograms per ml or 25 uh, millimoles uh, per liter of vitamin D, less than that, vitamin D deficiency is pretty well established. And this is what you see in rickets, three to five nanograms per ml. You have high parathyroid hormone levels and um, uh, you have tremendous bone resorption. On the other hand, there is a normal level that people have established, although we don't know what that was back then in the 90s and two, early 2000s, but most people said, oh, if you get above 30 nanograms per ml, you're healthy. And I can't tell you how many people have called me about blood levels of vitamin D between 30 and 60. And then some people say, well, look, you know, you got uh, the people in uh, middle Africa who have levels of 70, they must be healthy. So, so we could go to 80 or 90 to be healthy. And of course, that's all, very dependent on how much vitamin D you take in. But the big issue was the quote unquote insufficient vitamin D. There were papers, there was a review in New England Journal, vitamin D insufficiency. What is it? Well, it was defined by Dr. Hollick and others as being a level between 10 and 30 nanograms per ml. And this was arbitrarily decided to be a clinical condition of insufficiency. So the IOM, uh, when they don't know, they bring together experts. Uh, and we had a panel from 2009 to 2011, uh, lots of trips to Washington, lots of controversy. And they said to us, evaluate the evidence from clinical trials and tell us what you think the recommended dose of calcium and vitamin D should be for the normal population in the United States. So what did we have for evidence? We had some clinical trial data, not very good, observational data, expert opinion, which was driving the field, pretty much what uh, you heard earlier today, case reports, and then this thing I call magical thinking, which is I'll take vitamin D, I'd feel better. Uh, and uh, and when I go, I used to go to, they don't invite me anymore, but to a lot of uh, uh, <laughs> endocrine meetings. And I'd ask the people in the, in the floor, how many people take vitamin D? And 90% of the endocrinologists raise their hand. And I say, why? And they said, oh, because it's, it, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to show. The evidence is going to show this. And I said, really? Yeah. So it's this magical thinking. And this is highly visible among patients, as you can imagine. So the one piece of data we had was this, you know, quasi good um, uh, meta-analysis uh, from uh, uh, Tang and colleagues published in Lancet suggested 
about a 12% reduction in fracture. And it was pretty much driven by this terrible paper in New England Journal and the Women's Health Initiative in which they gave calcium and vitamin D and they showed about a 11% reduction in calcium and vitamin D. But half of those people were also randomized to estrogen. So if you take away the estrogen, there's no effect of calcium and vitamin D in the group that got it. But that still stands as one of the most highly cited papers, particularly in this field. So we got together and recommended six to 800 units of vitamin D a day and calcium. And little did I realize what I got myself into. So I wasn't the chairperson, but somehow everybody thought I was. So they'd all call me and they'd yell at me and scream at me. How could you say that? So uh, it, it's in a handbook produced by the government, but we decided to put it in JCNM because we thought uh, it would be more visible. And much to our disdain, we've had 5,000 citations on that paper. It's, uh, by, by far, the biggest paper in JCNM, I think, in history. But that led to all these comments and questions flooding the, the journal. How can you do this? So anyways, one of the other things that the IOM did, which makes it such a, now the National Academy of Science, is that they said, tell us what you think should be done. So the part that nobody read was that we need strong evidence. So we need randomized placebo controlled trials of calcium and vitamin D for all 36 of the indications that you asked us about from autism all the way to frailty. And so we wrote that in very strong language. And the NIH, when they hear that from the National Academy, that's something they're gonna do. So they responded and have funded tremendous numbers of studies but the best study to date, by far the best trial to date is the VITAL trial that Joanne Manson and the group at the Brigham have run. And from there, we can talk about the evidence. So this we published two years ago uh, in New England Journal. This was vitamin D supplements for cancer and cardiovascular disease. And here you can see there really is no difference. And again, patient-specific outcomes we were asking for, not surrogate measures, serum 25D, et cetera, patient-specific outcomes. And indeed, there's, there was no difference. Um, you know, there were some issues, if you look closely at this study, because it's a two-by-two two design, it, omega-3 fatty acids, which also doesn't do anything for cardiovascular disease or cancer. But, but because we thought it was so important, and because I'm an editor, I said, we got to get this out there. I know the statisticians, and and I talked about this. They were really upset. How can you publish a two-by-two two design as a one-by-one one sort of placebo randomized control? But it's so important because it's so negative. All right, so, so we got a lot of pushback from that. And of course, the studies on cancer prior to that were so small and of such short duration that, that, you know, that just wasn't even evidence. Um, this is a paper from 2010 in JAMA from uh, Saunders and colleague in Australia where they gave high dose vitamin D. So the biggest argument about vitamin D is that yes, in conventional doses, it doesn't work, but the more you give the better. So she gave 500,000 units once a year. And this didn't get a lot of visibility, except in the bone world, because this looks great, it's better, except the curves are really that vitamin D increases the risk of fractures. And we now see, there are now several papers that show that fracture risk and falls in particular are higher with one single dose of high dose vitamin D. So let's go down the list, vitamin D and fractures, vitamin D and cardiovascular disease, ARDS, preeclampsia, falls, infections, cancer. But what about COVID? <laughs> so Israeli study shows the strongest proof yet of vitamin D's power to fight COVID. Evidence of vitamin D is effective against COVID for neurosequelae. So uh, I, like Dr. Chopra, decided to put an email up <laughs> that I got from one of my long COVID patients in the recover patient, in the recover study. And I really... I've really learned a tremendous amount from my patients. 
who have long COVID in this recovery study. If nothing else, this trial design is a little awkward and stuff, but you listen to people and they're amazing. So I had a very positive appointment with a post COVID care doctor today, praying with new med diet supplements. I will start feeling relief because this is an awful way to live. 10,000 units of vitamin D. So we happened to look in the recover <laughs> data set and sure enough, calcium is 11.2. And, uh, you know, so this is not as safe as one would think it was 3000 milligrams of calcium on top of that. But this is out there. And when you ask the patients, the support groups, vitamin D is a cornerstone of treatment in the support groups. So we did a study, we looked at, and I can't, I suddenly realized on my run this morning, and I love the, uh, the, the, the run across from the rapid transit, the, the valley uh, run. And I was thinking, I said, I can't show this because Melissa Handel will yell at me if I show the results of the data. But we looked, we took a peek into COVID and we just submitted it to, I think, Annals, actually. We took a peek into uh, the 7.4 million subject database and the number of people who are on vitamin D. And you can imagine there's a tremendous number of people who got vitamin D in the hospital. Can't tell you the results. Stay tuned, but you probably can tell by my sense. So anyways, the vitamin D story. Don't tell Melissa, please. A marvelous hormone and vitamin enhances calcium absorption, has anti-proliferative effects in vitro for sure, has not been shown in any RPCT to impact acute or chronic disease, continues to be widely used, and my pariah status persists. So, so that's another obstacle in my life, but I'm actually feeling pretty good about it, especially with all the vital stuff. So I'm gonna finish, I got about five more minutes and then I'll take questions about something really fun and, and then something back to calorie restriction. So Rita Seeger was an internist who came to me when I was at the University of Maine faculty so I want to get my PhD in wildlife biology. So, so why are you talking to me? She said, I want to study why bears, when they hibernate, don't lose bone. So bears are really interesting. And so we're interested in marrow fat and what its role is in the marrow niche. This has been an area of, of interest for us. We had a 10-year program project from NI, uh, DDK on it. And my inspiration for this my mentor, Larry Royce, who passed away 10 years ago, but was so as a constant guiding light for me. So Rita says, I want to study bear physiology and bone. So Rita uh, helped me learn about bears. So they hibernate because they can't find food, not because it gets dark. And they eat 35,000 calories a day before they hibernate. And they're vegetarians, so how tough is that to get 35,000 calories? Uh, but when they hibernate, they're not totally asleep. They give birth and they lactate. So it's really interesting. And they're aneuric. So their creatinines go way up. And yet they're insulin sensitive despite this catabolic state. So it's back to the Zimbabwe kids. So what's going on? Why, why does that occur? And interestingly enough, bone mass is stable. And how do we know that? Well, Rita's husband's a radiologist. So he built a portable DEXA sort of machine. And they took us out to the den. So they got the main uh, wildlife uh, state organization to help them. They tagged all the, all the bears. And we went out to their dens. And they anesthetized them. And then they... Um, and then they draw blood and they get urine and then they do the bone density. And so these are the cubs, which are really cute as can be uh, with great claws. So we were out in the winter doing that. It was really fun. And Rita eventually published her work, showed that they had really unique biology that uh, had impact on the skeleton. So we were interested in this because the bears were had no, no nutrition, were using their fat stores, and they had high marrow fat. And this reminded us that in anorexia, they get multiple fractures, but they get a marked increase in bone marrow fat. And this seems so paradoxical to me that why 
during a state of total calorie deprivation, you actually see um, this fat infiltration. And when Rita did her thesis in front of the Wildlife Committee, I got really jazzed up and I said, no, this is so exciting. She's doing great work. And I said this thing about marrow fat. And they said, what's the surprise about marrow fat in starvation? If you go in roadkill, look at the roadkill. They're full of marrow fat. They're going out to find food. Their bones are full of fat. So this is a well-recognized feature of calorie restriction and malnutrition and ultimately of starvation. Why would we evolutionarily have a stem cell that was actually storing fat at a time the body was so in need of fat lipolysis? And so we started to do some experiments where in mice, we did calorie restriction, 30% calorie restriction, and we see the same sort of feature, bone loss and increased marrow fat. But if you give a high calorie diet, you can basically do the same thing. You get these same marrow adipocytes. So it really intrigued us as to what was going on. And we know that weight loss in general can cause bone loss. So I'm a big exerciser and I'm not trying to demean exercise, but in combination with calorie restriction and exercise, you can lose bone. And just listen to my story of having a vertebral fracture. And we know that in the, uh, in the women who have athletic triad, that exercise plus poor nutrition can lead to bone loss and fractures. So we decided to propose a very unusual study. We published it last year in JCI Insight. We took uh, 26 normal healthy volunteers in Boston, Massachusetts, Mass General, and we gave them $7,000. And we said, we want you to come in and fast for 10 days, go home, come back and get 10 days of McDonald's in the clinical research room. And everybody said, get lost. And we couldn't figure out why that was. 7,000 bucks to a student, it's great. So then we decided that what we had wrong was the order. So we said, we'll give you a high calorie diet first and then we'll send you away and then you'll fast. And we got 26 volunteers. So, so it really was important to sort of incentivize them to eat first. And then what we did is we, we did MRI because we could measure marrow fat through MRI. We got marrow serum, we got blood tests, and we got bone density measurements. And uh, Puna Fazelli, who's now uh, associate professor at University of Pittsburgh, did a lot of the heavy lifting along with Ann Klebanski, who I'm sure um, some of you know. So what we wanted, we had one simple question. Why is it that adipocytes are the same, look the same with high calorie diet or with calorie restriction? So no surprise, this is from the paper, but if you overfeed, you gain weight. If you fast, and this was a strict fast, you lose weight, 7% of your body weight. Uh, during stabilization, you regain that. What was really remarkable for us was that the, the MRI showed that these individuals with high fat feeding, males more than females tended to have higher uh, marrow fat increases, but fasting automatically induced the best increase in marrow fat. And most surprising was that within two weeks when they came back, they were fine, the marrow fat had disappeared. So there's something very acute about the signals in the marrow to food, which is really remarkable because we knew this in mice, but we didn't. We were totally shocked that this could uh, uh, reverse in two weeks. And so in some unpublished data that we're ready to, to send in, we began to do some discovery uh, genomics and lipidomics on these mice and a lot on the humans. And Sam Costa, a PhD graduate student in our lab, has done a lot of this work. So no surprise, both high calorie diet and fasting had the same effect, a cellular phenotype of tons of marrow fat, but there was virtually no overlap in the genes between the two. So this told us that functionally, it was very different. What they did by fasting was very different from what they did with a high calorie diet. And 
our initial hypothesis was there was a tremendous inflammatory response with high fat diet, just like there is long term with overeating in the peripheral fat. But in essence, what we found was the inflammatory response occurred in the um, in the calorie restri restricted um, in the, start, the fasted individuals, not in the high fat diet individuals. And so we began to look at some of the genes associated with that. And our old friends, the IGFs and IGFBPs, were the second biggest uh, signaling pathway in fasting. Um, and there were a number of other progenitors, that, uh, markers that were increased. So what we deduced, as well as the complement uh, signaling pathway, so the alternative complement pathway was being activated. So that was the cause of the inflammation in these fasted individuals. And... Uh, what we realized was that during fasting, the body is recruiting lots of progenitor cells into the marrow. And I think, of, I mean, I don't know the answer evolutionarily why this would occur, but I suspect that what the body is doing is refilling a system that will then allow those cells to become other cells later on or to provide energy for the cells that are necessary once the insult is uh, over with. So we looked at that and we found that they, the, these fat cells and calorie restricted had high, very high levels of lipoprotein lipase. They were taking lipids out of the circulation, actually storing them uh, rather than letting them out. And we now believe, and we have a paper, went through Nature Communications and got lost, and finally it's in eLife. And we think by deleting those adipocytes, we prevent the body from restoring hematopoiesis during states of calorie um, malnutrition. So stem cells are suppressed, but once that calorie restriction is let go, there is this marked rush to uh, increase hematopoietic progenitors and a return to normal homeostasis. And that's fueled by those fat cells that are waiting for that cue. And we know this from, uh, from re radiation of cancer patients. And right after radiation, especially with hematopoietic um, tumors, that there's this tremendous increase in marrow fat cells. And everybody said, oh, well, that's just filler. It's just filling up space, is isn't the manipoiesis. What it actually is, is by depleting those fat cells, we prevent the regeneration of metapoiesis. So we think there's a fuel source that the body has built in for the marrow. You know, you're trying to make a billion cells. You need fuel for this. And so that's where we think we are. We identified a, a, a protein complement factor D, which is adipsin, which for those of you in the fat field know is one of your early adipokines. And that adipsin is released um, during this activation of fasting, and it shuts off uh, osteoblast differentiation, uh, as well as possibly affecting hematopoiesis. So the mystery of marrow fat, fat is more than just a filler for the marrow. It responds to changes in nutrient intake in the marrow in the same way by the cellular phenotype, but functionally, it's very, very different. And why? What is the function of marrow fat? Why wouldn't it increase during times of fasting? Why would it increase? I think it's really a protective evolutionary measure to protect the most important element in your body, which is you need blood, you need hematopoiesis to protect yourself. So stay tuned. I think that's where we are, not a total random. So I'll finish with just saying, lessons learned, persistence pays off. Remember Stephen King, uh, he never got recognition, although he got lots of recognition elsewhere. Uh, he called me. Uh, I got a call from him one day. I was in my lab and I got this call. And he's the secretary. He said, it's Stephen King. And I thought, oh, man, I'm going to get a lot of money. <laughs> this is going to be great. So I pick up the phone. Wrong number. So but I did see him at a couple of functions. And he, he told me. He told me when he wasn't as famous, he says, Cliff, I'm going to put you in a book as the gland man. I'm still looking for it. I can't find it. Remember, follow the science, keep an open mind. I think one of the biggest problems we have is we're so 
agitated and so driven to prove our hypothesis that you don't see the forest from the trees, that there are clues out there that you would never think of. You have to keep your eyes open for that. I'm a huge collaborator. And don't be afraid to let others read your grant and your ideas. Know your mentors and mentees and never stop being a mentee. I love being a mentee to people like Dave Clements and, and others uh, because I, I continue to learn a tremendous amount. In fact, he had this snide remark to me the other day. He said, I saw your paper on IGF BP2 and vertical sleep gastrectomy. You didn't report the IGF ones. And I said, oh my God, we forgot to put them in. So you're learning stuff all the time. So these are some of my mentees both short and long distance mentees. And this is our lab and our generous support from the NIH. So thanks very much. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. And we have time for a, a few questions. Yeah. developing diabetes yeah yeah and is there a evolutionary I think even in period? older individuals now we understand this sort of tropical diabetes and it's a it's an insulin resistance type of phenotype okay is there like an evolutionary theory of why that would be like maybe the body isn't because it's not getting any calories it doesn't know how to process the sugar or well you know um, what we find in calorie restriction is there's a marked increase in insulin sensitivity so, so, that the, so you have less insulin for sure, uh, but the tissues are more sensitive. So, so one of the basis of aging, hallmarks of aging that we use is 30% uh, calorie restriction as a way to prolong life. And part of that is reducing insulin resistance yeah. by reducing insulin. So where that cutoff occurs, that it's too profound and it's damaging, it, it, it's unclear to me, but... But that's certainly an issue. And, you know, for us, we're struggling. I mean, we have a brand in now on, on intermittent fasting because we think that that's huge. That's a huge phenomenon. We think it might have skeletal damage from intermittent fasting. And we really want to know the answer to that question. Well, you, you said damage for possibly for intermittent? Yeah, well, I think, they cause, I think it causes bone loss. That's our hypothesis that oh. intermittent fasting might induce bone loss. And of course, we're interested in circadian fast, uh, mm -hmm. circadian type cycling as well. But we need to understand that, you know, the body's homeostasis is so profound. Trying to understand it's difficult. Huh? Mm -hmm. And then my second question is, have you guys detected any um, negative effects, maybe even in the short term of having high bone marrow fat? Yeah. So, so yes, the common theory is low bone density, high marrow fat. So we've been trying to prove that those adipocytes are, are damaging to the skeleton, that they release adipokines that release that. And we know with aging, there's tremendous increase in marrow fat and bone loss. Our problem is that we don't have a good model system. And I think I put that in one of the obstacles that we're up against a very difficult model system that we can't model uh, ex vivo, what we think is going on. We've tried with 3D printing and 3D uh, 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 cell cultures, but we don't have a good understanding. The common thinking is that having more marrow adipocytes can induce an inflammatory response from adipokines, which can have a negative effect on bone. It clearly suppresses hematopoiesis, but I think we can have to think of it in that way as why is it doing that? The stem cell population is suppressed. And again, we think it's an evolutionary process that's necessary during a time when there's insult or injury. Anything you do to the marrow, you're going to get marrow fat. If you ream it out, if you x-ray it, if you uh, remove it, um, anything you do, you're going to induce this injury response. And I, I think of it evolutionarily rather than as a negative thing. It clearly has some implications for the skeleton, though. Time for one last question. Yeah. 
an association between diabetes and total mass. Yes. Do you think that there's any um, this expansion of yeah. fat that might select for? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. We haven't explored it, and you know, we're a little worried because we're not hematologists. So we, we get nervous when we start taking that broad theory and taking it into the thing. But sure, I think that's possible. And type 1 diabetes in particular is often is almost always characterized by increased marrow fat. I think it's just the intracellular starvation phenomena that induces that marrow adiposity. So how that affects coronal hematopoiesis is really important. So what we did is we made a conditional mouse where we just deleted marrow adipocytes in the bone marrow. Uh, and, and then we tried to induce hematopoiesis and we were unable to do that uh, in the absence of marrow. And then we used a, another model where we blocked lipolysis using ATGL null mice crossed to these cells. And what we found was in the absence of lipolysis, no matter what you do, you can't induce hematopoiesis. So we think it's a fatty acid storage system that's really relevant during states of emergency. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Rosen. Great talk. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, in addition to Dr. Rosen, Dr. Chopra, Dr. Erlinson, Dr. Lyons, a uh, really excellent day. We're now gonna transition into virtual poster session mode. Uh, you'll find on your program in pages eight and nine, I believe, uh, a number of QR codes for the session that you want to attend. Uh, if you don't have a program with you, you can scan this QR code here, which should take you to the webpage that lists all the sites. And we'll all move into Zoom rooms starting at 1.15. All of the sessions will be hosted by Outstanding Early Career Scholars. And I hope to see you there. Thank you all for an excellent day.